Hello and welcome back to another great episode of the New Discourses podcast. I'm James Lindsay. We are exploring education. In fact, we're exploring Marxism and education. And so, as you know, if you're a fan of the podcast, that we're doing this gigantic, or I'm doing it, I guess. We're not. You can come with me. We're doing this gigantic um, kind of survey of the critical turn in education, critical education theory, a.k.a. critical pedagogy. And uh, that's going to take a long time, and we're going to go through a lot of resources so you can really understand what it is. But you also will know, if you've been paying attention to the podcast, that we're taking a slight diversion from the development I wanted to do originally, which was to just kind of start with the the, the history and work our way forward. Uh, and rather than being mired in kind of very abstract theoretical things, merely being mired in those, I should say, um, What we're going to be doing, what I'm doing right now is dipping into this kind of more contemporary stuff so that you can have a point of reference. So a recent episode here on the podcast, I dipped into uh, culturally relevant teaching. And uh, that's, of course, the the funny boogeyman word that, you know, well, we don't do critical race theory. We don't have CRT. We have culturally relevant teaching, which is also CRT. Sometimes it's culturally responsive teaching. There's a scarier variant called culturally sustaining teaching. And so what I did in that episode, recent episode here, was I read through um, one of the first papers, or maybe really the first paper of culturally relevant teaching, which was by Gloria Ladson Billings. Just to tell you who she is, she's a Marxist educator. She wrote that paper, which was toward a theory of culturally relevant teach pedagogy, I should say, in 1995. And she also wrote in 1995 in a different paper that I've spoken about, but have not read here on the podcast toward a critical race theory of education. So she's an education Marxist who was bringing critical race theory and whatever culturally relevant teaching might be in as early as 1995 and really a little bit before. But what you see in that podcast is that it's very difficult to understand what culturally relevant teaching is. She says it means having academic success, developing cultural competency, which she never actually defines, uh, but gives some examples that are stereotypical awkwardness. And then um, also the third characterization is that it develops critical consciousness and turns your kids into activists. And so Now, we've talked a lot about, in the past, critical race theory. A lot of people, in addition to myself, have talked about critical race theory in education. I have a lot going on uh, with regard to the Groomer Schools podcasts, for example, about how that and queer theory work together. Um, Critical race theory in education is kind of this well-worn path for the people that are paying attention to this issue. But I wanted to introduce culturally relevant teaching and these kind of buzzwords before I just keep going with this old abstract theoretical um, critical pedagogy to make it really unavoidably clear to you what the goals of that are, which are really just simply stated to turn your kids into Marxist activists. Um, That's really the point of critical pedagogy overall. And we could do it all on just, I guess, one eight-second podcast. The point of critical pedagogy is to make your kids into Marxist uh, activists. Thank you. Drive through. But we're still going to do all of those other episodes. But I think it's very important that we take some time to dip into what's actually happening today, the stuff that you're actually running into. And so culturally relevant teaching, critical race theory are two key buzzwords that are floating around in that space. Ethnic studies is another. I'll probably have to do something with that at some point. That's a complicated and deep topic that's had law behind it, like in California since the 60s. That's a complicated topic. But today's topic is social emotional learning, which is the hottest of hot topics right now in terms of Marxist educational buzzwords. And so what I want to explain briefly before I dive, I'm going to just read a paper for you just to introduce it because I like to introduce it in other people's words and then tell you what those words mean because everything Marxist can, is coded. And so every woke word contains an agenda is a maxim you have to remember. So I'm going to break it down for you. I'm going to go through this paper on it. But social emotional learning is a complicated topic. Now, I've had somebody challenge me a little bit on this and I don't know the truth and I don't have time to dig it up yet because I want to present what I have blatantly in front of me to you here today. But from my understanding, which accords with what several people who granted big grain of salt are academics have told me about social emotional learning is that it started off 
correctly. And I think this paper is actually going to back that up. Now, I've heard other people say, no, it was always a Trojan horse. And that might be true. Uh, the Marxists are really good at setting up Trojan horses, sometimes years or decades in advance of when they're going to spring the Marxist trap within them. But I, either way, the original formulation of social emotional learning was to do exactly what it sounds like. It's to take kids who have problems, troubled kids, and give them kind of interventions through really school psychologists to help them overcome the social and emotional difficulties. Maybe they have trouble at home. Maybe the curriculum you know, is frustrating them in a particular way. Maybe they have mood disorders. Maybe they have social issues uh, or they have trouble getting along with other kids for some reasons. And so bringing a program of what was called social emotional learning to them in small group settings or even individual settings has a track record of being very successful at bringing up their academic achievement by helping them find strategies to to, to know how to manage their emotions, to know how to deal with their emotions, to deal with the root causes of emotional reactions that are impacting their learning. And, um, you know, it may be as a Trojan horse, but it was working and you can see at least that there is a real thing there that's probably of value. The problem is, is that social emotional learning has evolved. And what I'm going to read about today is actually called transformative social and emotional learning. And uh, transformative, by the way, is a Marxist watchword. Transformation of society is one of the things that is their key goal. And so when you see something being transformative, basically in my experience, I found one of three spaces in which you run into this. One and there, one is if, if you uh, are dealing with Christians, they try to say that the gospel is transformative. Well, now you know it's in the Christian context. The idea is to become born again, which makes it weird in these other two contexts. The other is in like weird leadership coaching. Lots of transformative stuff there. And then the third is in communism, Marxism. And so transformative is... And Marxism refers to the idea that you're going to transform the society and thus transform yourself so that the society and you become socialist together. That's really what it's about. And so where there used to be regular social emotional learning that was maybe done by a school counselor or a qualified psychologist to intervene on social issues and psychological issues, emotional issues that might be impacting student learning, and that was going to be kind of a one-on-one -on -one thing, it got expanded out through a model first called CASEL, which we'll talk about in the paper, C-A-S-E-L. Uh, the S-E-L is still social and emotional learning. The C-A, we'll get to it. I, I have to remember what it actually stands for um, because it's in the paper. I didn't memorize it uh, again, but uh, it's here. Collaborative for academic social and emotional learning. So I knew it referred to an organization, but it's a collaborative. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, sounds like it's going to be something Marxist. It is. Um, and so when it moved into the castle model, which has these five pillars, we'll talk about that, it started to be deemed that, well, if this is good for troubled kids, well, all the kids probably have some degree of trauma. All the kids have lurking psychological issues. All the kids could benefit from learning how to manage their emotions better, especially with regard to learning challenges and how to manage their social environment. We'll get bullying down, et cetera. Those kinds of campaigns could easily be tucked in there. And so we're now going to apply it to all the kids, not in like when you do psychology, you don't do psychology on everybody. And you don't use a blanket program. It's a one-on-one -on -one or one-on small group endeavor. Uh, and now you're going to have teachers who are not psychologists trained to deliver castle social emotional learning. And the, these teachers are going to do this in a classroom setting, which is a non-therapeutic, uncontrolled environment with a group of children. So the, in my opinion, not necessarily the teacher putting SEO SEL into practice because it might just be their job, but the administrators and the teachers and the union members, et cetera, who are pushing for social and emotional learning, especially under this transformative model or under the castle model, belong in prison. They are trying to get teachers to um, practice psychology without a license in a non-therapeutic space in uncontrolled group environments on children, which is child abuse, and they belong in, in prison. It gets worse when you realize that if you listen to, say, my Groomer Schools podcasts, especially numbers two and three here on the New Discourses uh, podcast series, 
Ziz is lots of series. Many I know series plural is series, but I want to make clear that there's multiple series tucked within series. Um, if you listen to the groomer schools, especially numbers two and three, you'll realize that what's going on with SEL is actually psychologically abusive when it gets to this castle and transformative stuff. This shouldn't be a surprise if you've listened to now the culturally relevant teaching. Both things that I've actually mentioned here shouldn't be a surprise. One is that it's psychologically abusive so that they can make little Marxist activists out of your kids, which we're going to hear very explicitly and clearly in this paper. Um, And secondly, that they're taking something that works in a particular small context and then blowing it out into everybody uh, so that they can use it as a tool to manipulate large numbers of children and indoctrinate or program them into Marxist ideology. This is something that they exploit in both cases. If you remember Gloria Ladson Billings' paper about uh, culturally relevant teaching, She starts off by talking about little pilot programs or little experimental programs that were done in small schools in Hawaii with uh, Native Hawaiians and small schools with small groups of Native American students that had some success and then transforms that, hijacks it really, into another domain, which she takes it to African American students um, or black students in general. She mentions Latinos, but doesn't really ever talk about them. Asians get left out white kids, what it's for them is also left out. And it just gets hijacked into this other program based off of kind of small, very contextual programs where it worked. Now it's good for everybody. See the same thing with the SEL. Yeah, you have kids that have problems and you intervene with them with qualified psychological professionals and it helps them. Nope, we're just going to do it to everybody. Hijacked. Uh, So you see that. Then Gloria Ladson Billings also uses a study using eight teachers to justify uh, saying that we need a culturally relevant teaching in all of our schools across America and every program possible using eight teachers in one setting in Northern California as the model. And those eight teachers were selected by a mechanism that picked out them. Basically, it looks like you have to read between the lines to pick it up that she picked critical education theorist teachers by design uh, who had high ratings both with the parents and with the schools in terms of what they were achieving. So the ones who were doing something successfully for whatever set of reasons who are also committed to transformative change like we see in transformative social emotional learning. So that should be no surprise that we're seeing the same pattern. You see this everywhere in Wokeville, everywhere in Wokeville. You see things that are taken way out of context small studies, contextual circumstances blown out to everybody used as the mechanism and the justification for a broadband uh, programming of all children in schools. And social emotional learning is no different. The metaphor that I've given for social emotional learning, by the way, and you can listen to Groomer Schools 3 podcast here on New Discourses to get a sense of that. I don't know if I say in that podcast, but I certainly did a talk I gave in Franklin, Tennessee in the middle of January this uh, 2022 this year um, is that the metaphor is that it works like the hypodermic needle to inject uh, the different critical theories into your kids, the different Marxist ideas into your kids. Um, And so social emotional learning is not just a front word for critical race theory. A lot of people have that wrong right now. It is far bigger far worse, far more damaging. The point of it, the hypodermic needle is not really even enough because it's some of the poison in the needle too. Not only is it the injection mechanism, but the psychological tools that focus on trauma, et cetera, blah, 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 with the kids are used. Their techniques actually used to break the kids down psychologically. And then what you have on the other side of that is that they're going to then use the other contents, critical race theory, queer theory, gender theory, fat studies, et cetera, to um, literally reproduce the Maoist education program that Mao used to create the Red Guard and the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So they can create an American Cultural Revolution with an American Red Guard. But let's remember, they're making your children into their little revolutionaries. And if we remember from the culturally relevant teaching from Gloria Ladson Billings, that's exactly what she said the point of the program is. And that's going to be, again, pushed uh, across the board. So social emotional learning, very psychologically damaging. I don't exaggerate when I say that I believe it's my personal belief that everybody who is implementing this and knowing what it is and not because they're forced to by virtue of it being their job should go to prison. It is broadband. Not only is it the attempt to destroy our country from within and ruin education for a Marxist political agenda or even religious agenda. Not only is it therefore the application of a state religion, uh, but it is also psychological abuse 
done by people who are unqualified in settings that it shouldn't be happening, et cetera, et cetera. This is just an absolutely unconscionable thing to be going to have, have going on in our schools. And if, you know, you get a chance, go look up. There are a lot of people now digging these things up and showing examples of what's being done under the umbrella of social emotional learning, weird surveys where they're collecting data off of your kids, asking them extraordinarily personal questions, kind of setting them up for these kind of struggle session environments in the classroom, creating the space where they're going to bring in critical race theory to bully people about their race, bring in queer theory to bully people about their sex, gender, and sexuality, create the red identity, black identity, Maoism to break your kids down and turn them into activists. Uh, it's all really bad. Nothing, nothing to commend what social and emotional learning has become, uh, whatever its beginnings were. So with that rather long-winded introduction to what we're doing here, um, I want to dive into this paper, which is also a bit long, so you're going to have to bear with me, but I want you to hear what this is really about in their words. It's not enough to just have me rant about it. You actually have to hear, this is what they really think. And so who are the they? In this case, it is uh, three education, educational psychologists, I suppose. Robert J. Yeagers, maybe J-A-G-E-R-S, Deborah Rivas Drake, and Brittany Williams. And so these three have written a paper in Educational Psychologist, that's the name of the journal, Educational Psychologist, dated 2019, so it's relatively recent, and the title is Transformative Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, Toward SEL in Service of Educational Equity and Excellence. Uh, and so you can look up this paper if you want to read, it, read along with it. Uh, I'll try to include a link on new discourses to the paper as well. Um, this is the, the real deal. So again, whatever social emotional learning used to be, it got replaced with the castle model, which we'll hear about in detail in this paper, and then incorporated this, it has morphed into this transformative social and emotional learning. And I'm told by people working around the social emotional learning uh, area that it's social emotional learning is already transforming into something even more explicitly Marxist, which is liberated education. And so those are terms you're going to want to look out for, but I can't urge, I can't stress firmly enough that, that when, if you see the word transformative attached to a bunch of jargon, you're probably dealing with Marxists. The only context in which that's not <laughs> going to be the case, uh, or at least you're dealing with something kind of Marxy, groomy, whatever it happens to be. The only place where that's not the case is if it's Christians talking about the transformative nature of the gospel in my experience. Um, so let's dive in. I encourage you to listen to some of the other podcasts. I mentioned the one about culturally relevant teaching or pedagogy. I also mentioned the entire critical pedagogy series it's unfolding and the groomer schools series. It's getting to the point where it's very difficult to understand everything that's going on with all of this, unless you start to kind of cross reference off of other things. And I hate that, but it is what it is. So again, this is a 2019 paper. This is the direction that social emotional learning has gone and is going toward apparently maybe this thing called liberated education that if you understand how they use the word liberated is nakedly Marxism. Uh, and this paper again is titled Transformative Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, toward SEL in service of educational equity and excellence. So we hear equity right there. Equity, of course, is just the updated neo-Marxist code word for socialism and socialism in the Marxian sense that's meant to move on toward communism, which in the realm of uh, woke Marxism or woke neo-Marxism is called justice, now, social justice as it happens. Isn't that funny how that works out? Just like how the equity here, actually, they don't say it usually, but actually refers to what the literature calls social equity theory. Social equity leads to social justice, just like socialism leads to communism when it's all Marxist. Okay. This paper, by the way, is fairly long, like I said, and it's going to be fun when we get to the bottom and find out who paid for it, so stick around. So the abstract reads, this article seeks to develop transformative social and emotional learning, SEL, a form of SEL intended to promote equity and excellence among children, young people, and adults. We focus on issues of race, race and ethnicity as a first step toward addressing the broader range of extant inequities. So here we are two sentences into the abstract and you see this is all about equity. It's Marxist. This is, this is woke Marxism. No question. 
absolutely the point is we're going to use race as the tool so guess who's going to be here critical race theory is going to be here to try to address inequities which means differences in outcome by racial or ethnic group on average as analyzed by race marxism aka critical race theory uh so this word has come up twice in the first two sentences of this thing transformative sel is anchored in the notion of justice oriented citizenship what does justice mean communism hmm what is it doesn't that make it make more sense when you do that transformative sel is anchored in the notion of communist oriented citizenship yeah of course it does justice oriented citizenship and we discuss issues of culture identity agency belonging and engagement as relevant expressions of the collaborative for academic social and emotional learning five core competencies that's the castle model c a collaborative for academic sel castle um culture that's this is identity-based cultural marxism so there's that identity whoop there you go identity-based cultural marxism agency marxists have an upside down view of agency you're only agentic if you are actually working within their theories otherwise you have false consciousness belonging means that you're being positively affirmed into uh your identity politics which is more woke marxism and engagement is only considered authentic when you are engaging through the lenses of theory as you can read in the engagement entry on the new discourses woke encyclopedia translations from the wokish we also point they say to programs and practices that hold promise for cultivating these competencies and the importance of adult professional development and making these efforts maximally effective for diverse children and youth what are diverse children and youth hmm we conclude by offering a few next steps to further advance transformative SEL research and practice. Now, let me, I, I posed a question as if I was going to leave it rhetorical. What are diverse children and youth? Well, we know that under the critical theories of identity, aka woke Marxism, that you are only diverse if you're expressing the unique voice of your cultural group, which is determined structurally by this structure of society that's determined by the power dynamics that create the base who is excluded from privilege and the superstructure that has ideologies that justify why they are, are, are granted access to privilege. And that conflict across those those social relations creates a structure for society that structure is deterministic in shaping the character views ideas morals etc of the people who are affected by that on both sides whether privileged or oppressed re relatively or relationally speaking social relations relationally speaking um, and so you're only diverse if you actually have this critical consciousness awakened and you are from different groups speaking so-called authentically or according to the way that this critical structuralist view says that your identity group taken as a culture should be speaking to talk about the relevance of those power dynamics in the identity Marxist way. I have to keep breaking that down, but that's what diverse means. Diverse doesn't mean you look different. Diverse doesn't mean that you come from different homes. Diverse doesn't mean that you have different politics for sure. What diverse means is that you're all critical theorists who come from different backgrounds and speak through your so-called unique voice of color and you have different voices, or maybe it's not color, color, unique voice of identity group, uh, color being one of them. That's a critical race theory term of art. Uh, the structural determinism of structural racism or systemic racism creates a unique voice of color for the people of color that's actually then fragments into each different race well is this true for for gay kids for people or trans or what you know demisexual fat or disabled or specifically disabled or whatever mentally ill etc and so you're only diverse if you're saying what critical theory says you should be saying in other words you're only diverse if you all have exactly the same politics from this so-called this is jose medina's word for it kaleidoscopic perspective uh, of all the different possible intersectional identity categories and so diverse means critical woke marxist that's what it means it's all it means so maximally effective for diverse children and youth okay so people who are going to be brought into and part of the woke marxist program so let's read the paper like i said it's long bear with me 
social and emotional learning, SEL, commonly. So we want to know what this is, right? Everybody keeps asking me everywhere I go right now, what is SEL? Can you explain SEL? How is it used? And I have to talk kind of vaguely, uh, but in this podcast, we're not going to talk kind of vaguely because this is what you're going to hear. It's like with culturally relevant teaching, there's no clear definition really ever given, uh, but you can talk about the kind of the three key points it does. Well, here we're going to get a taste of what social emotional learning is actually about, how they actually define it. We're going to do it in their own words and we're going to break it down so everybody can understand. And we're not going to horse around like you kind of have to when you're doing it off the cuff, because of course they spend three to five paragraphs defining everything in the woke literature. So you can never quite say what it is and it can mean kind of anything it needs to uh, within some range. But at any rate, social and emotional learning, SEL, commonly refers to a process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible choices. So again, you can see the double-edged sword here, right? You can see especially the, the key word really here. Oh, you, we want kids to people to learn how to manage emotions. We want them to set and achieve positive goals. We definitely want that. We want to have establishing and maintaining positive relationships, which you can already see there. What defines a relationship being positive? Well, if you listen to Robin DiAngelo, for example, in, say, uh, White Fragility, she tells you that a cross-racial relationship is never authentic. So I would assume that goes into being positive, unless it is constantly engaging the systemic racism that actually characterizes the difference within it, the economy of difference within it. And so we do want positive relationships, but you can see that now there's squishy room where they're going to be able to slide crap in there. Make responsible decisions, responsible according to who. The Marxists don't make very responsible decisions. They want everybody else to pay for all their stuff. And so a responsible decision for a Marxist means doing things that are in line with Marxism. Hmm. But then I skipped one. Feel and show empathy for others. Empathy is the real lever here within social emotional learning. That's how they're going to use basically social emotional learning is cult indoctrination. They're going to tell people, that the kids particularly, that they don't care enough and don't care in the right ways and are therefore bad, stupid, or maybe crazy, but probably just bad or stupid. They're, they're morally evil. They're complicit in evil. They don't understand how things really work. So they're kind of dim. They're kind of stupid. And what that's going to do is induce vulnerability and then they're going to be told how they should feel about things. And if you're a parent and dealing with kids in schools right now that have SEL in them, which is most of them, you will know that I'm not making this up. They will tell them how they're supposed to feel about these situations, what that empathy is supposed to look like. And they're going to groom them further and further into this. They're going to make them vulnerable. That's the psychological breaking down part. And then they're going to use the critical theories to tell people how they're supposed to feel, the kids, how they're supposed to feel about things and use that to groom them further and further and further into the woke cult. This is cult grooming. Social emotional learning is cult grooming, and the cult is woke Marxism. It wasn't necessarily always that. So we'll go back to the paper. The field emerged formally some 25 years ago. Remember, this is a 2019 paper, so we can do the math, figure out that that's roughly, a, what, 1994-ish? Uh, so mid-1990s. The field emerged formally some 25 years ago, and over the past few years, the evidence accumulated from basic and applied research, lots of citations that I have not read, uh, has prompted practitioners researchers and policymakers to advocate for the adoption of such programs for pre-K through 12 students in school uh, and sorry for pre-K through 12 students in school and out of school settings. And so um, practitioners of the thing are going to advocate for the adoption of the thing. That's a shocker. Researchers who also have a conflict of interest are going to advocate for it because then their research is justified. That's a shocker. And policymakers, well, who? Are they Marxists? I hate to have to use a critical lens, but they necessitate that you use a critical lens and ask questions like who is doing this and who benefits and how are they doing it and under what assumptions? Because everything in woke land is iron law of woke projection, which never, ever misses. So they're telling us that 25 years ago, SEL came about, it had some success stories, and it caused people who were affiliated with it to push it even harder. If it came in originally as a Trojan horse or not, I don't know. I'm reading a 2019 paper, not something from 1994-ish. Um, although much is known, they tell us, 
about the influences and impacts of SEL efforts, there are still substantial gaps in our understanding of whether and in what ways SEL programs and approaches can best advance optimal academic, social, and emotional competence development of all children. I'm always skeptical when they say of all children, of all people, or whatever, because when you start thinking in terms of power dynamics, all becomes, believe it or not, a code word that means if you help the most oppressed, then everybody comes along. That's why Black Lives Matter was okay in All Lives Matter, which is even bigger, more, uh, you know, universal and humanizing and, and, you know, even Imago Dei, if you're religious kind of statement. All Lives Matter is utterly taboo. And in fact, hate speech is because when you say all, what you actually mean is oppressed when it's Marxist, because the assumption is that the privileged kids are already being served and the oppressed kids are the ones who are not the underserved or the oppressed or the those excluded from privilege. And so you can see that this is intrinsically scapegoating. So I'm not saying they said that here. I'm saying, what are they saying? You have to ask these questions. And what is optimal? I, I can guess it may be what advancing optimal academic competence might look like. I'm not sure how they're going to assess it since they don't like standardized tests and they're even skeptical of GPA. But uh, what is optimal social and, social and emotional competence look like for somebody who's pushing this? And like I said, in practice, from what I keep hearing from school system after school system, parent after parent of children, after of child after child, is that they're telling the kids what the correct social and emotional reactions are or conditions are, or circumstances are based on using critical theories like queer theory, gender theory, and critical race theory to determine what the right answer to these questions are. You can look at like what they're telling kids with COVID, and you can t look at what they're telling kids with racism, and you can look at what they're telling kids with masks and all of these different things to get some sense of that, or how they bring political events like January 6th into the classroom or Trump's election into the classroom. And they tell the kids what the right emotional reaction is to, to those things or Biden's election or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg's death. And you're telling the kids what their correct politically relevant emotional reactions and social interactions should look like around that. And you can see that's cult grooming in the classroom where your children are the cult target. They are the mark. Uh, for example, they say Jones et al. 2019 asserted that a research agenda for the next generation must necessarily include increased precision in constructs and associated measures within a developmental progression. A better understanding of the nature and processes for training and professional development of educators that leads to high quality implementation, attention to the influences and impact of integrated social, emotional, and academic learning at the level of the student in settings, e.g. school, family, extended learning, and last but not least, whether and what ways such efforts can contribute to more equitable learning experiences and outcomes for children, youth, and adults from diverse backgrounds and circumstances. The equitable thing just had to get shoved in there and for diverse just had to get shoved in there. And we already talked about what those mean. Just remember that when you hear those words, if you hear those words, you're hearing communist or Marxist agendas tucked in to what's going on. Um, what I want to kind of hesitate or to highlight on here is uh, that, you know, they're looking for how are we going to come up with high quality implementation? Fine. But you know, what it means that they're going to claim that they have unique uh, expertise to tell everybody how schooling needs to be. But what I really wanted to draw attention to is the impacts of integrated social, emotional, and academic learning. So now what they're saying subtly here is that the point of the school is in fact not just to teach the academic subjects and to you know somewhat manage the classroom so that it's a positive and safe learning environment, psychologically safe learning environment, I mean, but rather to integrate social, emotional, and academic learning into one kind of morass that's going to be under their control. And of course, they are social theorists who are emotional abusers because of the uh, poisoned nature of their social theory. And so the idea is at the very best, which is terrible, you're now taking academic instruction time out and replacing it with social and emotional coaching within the classroom. The content of that social and emotional coaching, which is already stolen from academic time, the content of that social and emotional uh, learning con uh, material 
is going to be up to the discretion of the people creating the curriculum and implementing it, who, if they are Marxists, are going to do it in the Marxist way. And so now we're replacing academic learning, trying to integrate against academic learning under the brand name of social emotional learning with social and emotional lessons. So your math class now is going to take away from practicing mathematical skills or learning mathematical skills, for example, and using mathematical examples to move social and emotional questions for the kids, which is a uh, a theft of proper instructional time and academic excellence, which is, of course, why you see diminishing academic excellence and you, the Marxist theory is upside down and wrong, which is why you see increasing social friction and emotional disturbance. You, you're going to tell us that these fuckers have put this shit in the schools for a couple of decades now and it works so well that we have record amounts of depression, anxiety, and kid suicides because it works so fucking well? Get off me. Sorry, I got a little worked up I'm going full Alex Jones over here these days. When I read this stuff, I get so mad. I understand why Alex gets so mad. Like, think about what they're doing. Integrated social, emotional, and academic learning. You frauds. Abusive frauds. We're going to hear, though, that it's about building a critical consciousness. That's what it's really about. Why? Because we have to achieve equity for kids from diverse backgrounds, which means authentic voice of color, and equity means fucking socialism. This article builds on our recent efforts to help advance the research agenda for the next generation by focusing on SEL in the service of equity and excellence. Equ excellence is off to the side. Equity is the first thing that SEL is supposed to achieve. So you know it's Marxist. Scholars and practitioners have raised important questions about whether guiding frameworks, prominent programs, and associated assessments adequately reflect, cultivate, and leverage cultural assets and promote the optimal well-being of young people, especially those from communities of color and under-resourced backgrounds. This is exactly the same shit they pull every time. So they hold up these poor kids who are from either communities of color, whatever the hell that means, under-resourced backgrounds, or uh, and then hold up these groups, and then they hold up the idea of their optimal well-being as something that the school is responsible for, how by leveraging cultural assets. And so they're diverting again from the academic mission. And they're now saying, we've called into, we've used this program to call into question the assessments that we're using, whether those actually adequately reflect, cultivate, and leverage cultural assets and promote the optimal well-being. So they're kid, your kids, in some thing the Marxists have redefined as their well-being, uh, is now being hijacked as the justification to break them down psychologically and stick critical theory in there until they become Marxists. The concept they tell us of transformative SEL is a means to better articulate the potential of SEL to mitigate the educational, social, and economic inequities that derive from the interrelated legacies of racialized cultural oppression in the United States and globally. Uh, oh, in the United States and globally. Period. Okay, now wait. The concept of transformative SEL is a means to better articulate the potential of SEL to do Marxism, mitigate the blah, blah, blah inequities, educational, social, and economic inequities that derive from the what? The structure of society that's defined by so-called interrelated legacies of racialized cultural oppression. Critical race theory is going to be the tool for doing that. And so you hear yet again. Now, what they've just said is, well, SEL has been in, involved for 25 years. There are already reasons for us to be concerned about it. From my perspective, from the outside perspective, as far as it being a Trojan horse or an open door for Marxism, but it's been used for 25 years. And then there's this model that's come along and it starts to focus on equity. And we have to start asking questions if the model that we've been using for SEL is actually that good. And so now we're going to invent this new thing called transformative SEL that's going to be rooted straight up in the concern that it's not Marxist enough. Let me read the part again, unless, unless you missed it. The concept of transformative SEL is a means to better articulate the potential of SEL to mitigate the educational, social, and economic inequities faced by the children. It is, how, we, how do we take this tool, SEL, and make it more focused on the Marxist agenda. That's what transformative SEL is. And most of the SEL that's being brought in through the CASEL model, which is most of the SEL in the country now, is coming in through, or in this type, it's transformative. It is the Marxist program. 
Transformative SEL represents an as-yet underutilized approach that SEL researchers and practitioners can use if they seek to effectively address issues such as power, privilege, prejudice, discrimination, social justice, empowerment, and self-determination. Marxism. Identity Marxism. Transformative SEL is an underutilized tool to make school about power, privilege, prejudice, discrimination, social justice, and empowerment, and self-determination. In essence, we argue that for SEL to adequately serve those from underdeveloped, underserved communities and promote the optimal development, out, developmental outcomes for all children, youth, and adults, it must cultivate them in the knowledge, attitudes, and skills required for critical examination and collaborative action to address root causes of inequities. That's a lot of syllables, that last part, isn't it? So we're going to hold up. Why do we have to do this? Oh, the kids from underserved communities. Those are our human shield. And then we're going to say for out, we have to improve optimal developmental outcomes for all children, youth, and adults. And the, the way we're going to do this is by cultivating them in the knowledge, attitudes, and skills required for what? Critical examination. In other words, critical Marxism, as Isaac Gotsman has it. And collaborative action. In other words, collectivism, communism, and, and becoming an activist wedding theory and praxis to do what to address the root causes of inequities in other words to try to create a transformative situation a revolutionary situation in which we can overthrow the existing inequitable system and replace it with one run by people like critical race theorists queer theorists etc now let me just go back one point real quick with that Promote the optimal developmental outcomes for all children, youth, and adults is what this is supposed to be about. But we already heard in groomer schools, in the groomer school series, that part of this includes the comprehensive sex education program that's in the SEL. CSE, uh, comprehensive sex education, is inside the SEL programs, and it includes the gender theory and the queer theory and so on. Now... We read in Hannah Dyer's paper in Groomer Schools 2, which is about Hannah Dyer's paper about queer futurity and developmental psychology for children, that the point of queer theory is not to help gay and lesbian, etc., LGBTQ, she says, children develop stable LGBTQ, LGBTQ identities. It is not the point of what's in this program. Remember, we're after their optimal well-being, the optimal developmental outcomes, and the queer theory that's inside this from Hannah Dyer's own paper. Go listen to Groomer Schools too. You're here, you'll hear it clearly or read that paper. The queer theory in there is designed specifically not to create stable outcomes, identity outcomes for LGBTQ people, but rather to turn them into queer activists, political activists who have a lack of a stable identity because that would be anti-queer. That her point was, in fact, that all of developmental psychology, especially in early childhood education and its application to early childhood education, needs to be overthrown in terms of queer theory, which destabilizes identity on purpose, even for LGBTQ kids, specifically on purpose. And this, they tell us here, is supposed to promote the optimal developmental outcomes for all children, youth, and adults. And that's because people like Hannah Dyer and the queer theory and these other Marxists that adopt this shit think that only by getting rid of childhood innocence and replacing it with stuff like queer theory, critical race theory, etc., can you possibly have a correct model of childhood development. So what does optimal childhood development mean? It means showing your kids things that if I were to say them on this podcast, as I did in groomer schools too, that this podcast will be demonetized. As you can see in the book, gender queer, uh, there's other ones, lawn boy or something like that. There's a bunch of other ones, these, uh, groomer books that they're using in the schools, for example, optimal developmental outcomes. So when you understand, that sounds great. Yeah, we want optimal developmental outcomes. But when you understand that the way that they're going to look at developmental out outcomes starts with the assumption that the uh, idea that children are, are, are intrinsically innocent and that their childhood innocence is something worth preserving and protecting and, and, and not spoiling through inappropriate sexual and racial content, that they flip this upside down and believe that you must engage race and adult sexual themes as early as possible 
to have optimal development and that they think that the existing developmental psychology is corrupted by ideologies like white supremacy and heteronormativity and uh, cis normativity and so on that all have to be challenged and overthrown and replaced by critical race theory and queer theory. You have to freak the hell out when you read that their goal with this is to promote optimal developmental outcomes in children because they don't know what those are. Theirs are upside down. They're inverted. They're insane. They're Marxist. They're sexual and they're racially inappropriate. And they think that the idea that there is such a thing as age appropriateness for these lessons is in fact a narrative propped up by the society so that the children will not develop in uh, correctly. They will be uh, brainwashed or programmed into the modes and mores of the existing society rather than becoming Marxist revolutionaries. Isn't that fun when you actually, this is why I read these papers and I'm like, oh my God. And other people read these papers and like, I don't really know what that says. And I'm like, I read these papers and I'm like, oh my God. Cause you even read something like optimal childhood development. Well, you want that. But then you're like, well, how do they approach that? And you read some other paper where they talk about childhood development and you see that it means things like trying to sexualize your, your kids from early grade school. It means having completely inappropriate race conversations with your kids and history lessons with your kids, just like the communists have done all along. If you talk to talk to somebody from China who went through the Maoist schooling, how brutal and inappropriate the lessons were about murdering and raping and killing. Horrible lessons they're feeding to children so that they could use that to demonize the capitalists saying that it was the fault of the capitalists that those horrible things happened, which is a form of cult indoctrination. You induce vulnerability, then you give the kids away out of the vulnerability by letting or people away out of that vulnerability through the cult doctrine, which in this case is Marxism, which is to say become a revolutionary to overthrow this oppressive system and we can end it forever. You see it with feminists in colleges. Rape is everywhere. Oh my gosh, there's rape culture on campus. Rape is the hugest problem. You're just now, you're young, 18, 19 year old girls, 17 year old girls, just leaving your parents home for the first time. Rape is everywhere. You're now not protected by your parents. All kinds of bad things are likely to happen to you. And you should be really scared of that. We have rape culture on campus that defends it, especially in the fraternities. What can you do? You can become a feminist. You can join our feminist union. You can protest rape culture. We can end rape culture on campus totally, which of course rape culture is very ambiguous and is never quite clear and all kinds of things count. And so you make them feel vulnerability. You're probably going to get raped because you're in college now. Young woman that's just out of your parents' house for the first time, you're probably going to get raped because you're in college now. Not true, but they say this, they pad it with bad statistics on bogus studies that one in five, maybe one in four uh, young women are going to get raped in college. It's not true. It's not a great number, but it's not that number. Um, And then you say, you know what you can do though? You can become an activist in our weird feminism and read lots of feminist literature and go yell about it and like make yourself ugly and a psychotic leftist. And then you're less likely to get raped and we can end rape culture totally, which they never actually tell you what it is. And you can totally understand how this works. That it's a cult indoctrination. And it's bad enough that they're doing it to young, vulnerable kids as they go off to college, taking advantage of that transition time, which is a very vulnerable time, the most vulnerable times other than childhood, the most most likely times other than as a young child that you can mold somebody's personality significantly is when they go off to college for the first time or when they go off and move to their adult city, new, some new city for the first time because they're socially isolated and you can bring them into a social group that thinks in a particular way. And the Marxists are manipulating that with, with to tremendous effect to create a so-called student movement, which was always the goal of the neo-Marxists from the 50s and 60s. Why? Because they saw that it worked in China, partly. Partly because they saw that it worked with their radicalizable students who are much more radicalizable than normal people or the, working, or the workers that they'd been focusing on before that. Toward this, and now we're talking though about your children in schools, like kindergarten. Toward this end, transformative SEL is aimed at educational equity. Could it be more plain? Transformative SEL is aimed at educational equity. What does equity mean? Equity in the current context given is defined by H. George Fredrickson from a theory of social equity. And he says, where equality means citizens A and B are equal, equity means adjusting shares so that citizens A and B are made equal. So you have a managed system where shares are adjusted so that people are made equal in their outcomes. That's socialism. Transformative SEL is aimed at educational equity. 
In other words, you're going to for and you're going to use this to create equalized, falsely equalized outcomes across the students. Particularly because it's woke Marxism, it's going to be across group membership where the relevant, not necessarily individuals, where the relevant uh, equalization has to occur. So this is where you see that equity equalizes downward. Everybody's going to, it's too hard to bring, it's in fact impossible to bring the worst up to the level of the best, but it's not that hard to bring the best down to the level of the worst. And so you're always going to end up with a lot of dragging everything down uh, in order to get equality in outcomes, which is not actually a virtue. In fact, it's an anti-virtue. So what did they say about this? Transformative SEL is aimed at educational equity, fostering more equitable learning environments and producing equitable outcomes for children and young people farthest from opportunity. So we're going to bias education as hard as we can, such that the critical theorists behind this, the Marxists behind this, are going to get to define who are the kids furthest from opportunity. And then we're going to bias all of education so that we create equitable outcomes that are targeted toward those people. That's the primary objective of transformative SEL. That's what they're replacing actual academic excellence with in your kids' schools. This educational equity implies that every student has what she or he needs when they need it. That's the line they trot out that sounds so good. Yes, of course we want everybody to have the resources that they need, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, language, disability, family background, or family income. Sounds great, doesn't it? Except that's not what it actually means. Has everything, uh, it implies that every student has what he or she needs when they need it, which means that you're going to adjust shares and you're going to tell this by whether the outcomes come out equally, you're going to adjust shares so that if the outcomes aren't equal, you're going to say, well, they must not have had what they, what they needed at the time they needed it. So we're going to adjust shares so that they get different treatment, special treatment, or we're going to handicap other people by getting rid of gifted programs, et cetera, which in fact is getting rid of something that some kids need when they need it uh, because gifted is has always been classified under special ed for a reason. Gifted students are very smart, but they very easily disengage and have other learning problems unless you have gifted programs for them. But we're going to get rid of those because we have to, those kids are privileged. They're intelligent. They probably have rich parents or something. We have to produce equitable outcomes for children and young people furthest from opportunity. Do you see how evil and twisted this is? And so this is what they're going to start telling the kids in the classroom and the teachers and the, throughout the school is what education is actually all about. And they're going to reorient everything in every classroom. And when people object, they're going to get Marxist reeducated into an equity mindset, or else they're going to be told that they're racist, sexist, et cetera, using the critical race theory, the queer theory, or whatever else. This is psychological abuse. The people implementing this on purpose, like the people writing this paper, belong in prison. This is psychological abuse of children to achieve a destruction of our society from within. They belong in prison. This includes, they tell us, examining biases and replacing inequitable practices with those that lend themselves to fertile, inclusive, multicultural learning environments that cultivate the interests and talents of children, youth, and adults from diverse backgrounds. Lots of fun little words like diverse backgrounds that hide the fact that they mean something very specific. I don't have to cover it again. They make it sound so good. Examining biases, that's critical theory, guys. Replacing inequitable practices with those that lend themselves to equitable outcomes, multicultural learning environments, fertile, inclusive, etc., for diverse kids specifically, who are furthest from opportunity, as defined by these activists. <sighs> so they're going to replace any practice where you end up with unequal outcomes with some practice that generates more equitable, as they say, outcomes. Like, for example, Nobody fails. Grades are only A, B, and C. Nobody gets a bad grade. Let's just give everybody A's. These are things that they've done for real in real schools. Let's put kids in group learning where everybody gets the same grade in the group. That's another one. We'll 
take some of the worst, most troublemaking kids in the class and stick them with some of the best kids in the class. And you know what's going to happen is those troublemakers are going to bully the good kids to doing their work. And the good, the good students are going to get kind of alienated and washed out of it. And they're going to do a half-assed job and everybody's going to get their B or whatever, but then they're going to get an A actually because you have to do equitable learning and the bad kids in the group. So everybody has to get an A. And allegedly the good kid who's learned basically nothing except how much this communist bullshit sucks is uh, just going to get alienated out of the system, but he's supposed to be happy or she's supposed to be happy because she got her stupid grade that didn't mean anything and undercut her actual sense of achievement because achievement, of course, is privilege and, and privilege is bad and achievement is bad and achieving would be terrible in an equitable society because then some people would out achieve other people. And the socialists, if we remember from our Herbert Marcuse that we read, can't figure out why the fuck they can't make a society that works. They're like, oh, the socialist societies can't get to the level of production that capitalist societies do. So maybe we need to bring down the standard and have less stuff and be happy with that. Equity equalizes downward. It ruins. It destroys achievement. It destroys competence in the name of this weird. It's not about the underserved student. That person's a human shield. It's about the grifter implementing this shit who belongs in prison. In this article, we focus on issues of SEL and educational equity with regard to race, ethnicity as a critical first step and seeking to specify how SEL might be leveraged in the service of equity for a range of minoritized people within the U.S. social system. I didn't want to have to stop again. That's mostly a sentence out of the abstract we already covered, but minoritized. Let's pause on the word minoritized. Minoritize is one of those funny words in Marxism where they've taken a word like minority and replaced it with a verb minoritized. They have had something has happened to them to make them minoritized. In other words, the structures of power, which are almost agentic in themselves, almost like demigods or deity, pagan deities have pushed these impose. They've imposed race. They've imposed, uh, you know, sexual exclusionary or gender exclusionary attitudes onto these poor people. And they have made them into minorities. They have disabled people who have disabilities uh, by being attitudes that put them in a place where they're not elevated to e equal status, even if that's actually physically not possible. And so the systems of society have forced people into inequity. They have been minoritized. They have been made into minority status, even though they are intrinsically equal, because that's the underlying social man assumption of Marxism. So we pause on that word. Racialized oppression, they say, was foundational to the establishment of the United States. Like anybody gives a shit, we had a civil rights movement, guys. Like they keep bringing this up because they believe that a system once in place short of a revolution always creates ideologies to maintain the same problem. And in fact, things like racism don't get better over time, say through abolition of slavery and a civil rights movement and full every full equal rights to every person, regardless of skin color, 14th Amendment, for example, uh, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. No, they don't actually get better. They get worse because the same problems persist because the system didn't actually change. The ideologists found, a, found ways to hide it better and make it even less visible and thus even more pernicious so that people are being discriminated against and oppressed without even knowing that it's happening. And they argue this explicitly. They argue literally that racism, I'm not saying it even just because of the, the factor of it being more hidden. There are other reasons. They actually argue that racism has gotten worse in the United States since it's founding. So they invoke the founding with this upside down inverted assumption that it just keeps getting worse unless you give us a critical race theory Marxist revolution. So racialized oppression was foundational to the establishment of the United States and persists as a vexing unresolved cluster of problems for sizable portions of the population. Along with well-known projections that the United States will be a quote minority majority nation within less than three decades, uh, is the reality that an increasing number of school-aged children and youth reside in poor or low-income families and communities. That's a non-sequitur. Along with the well-known projections that we're going to be minority-majority sometime, you know, I actually had somebody in my family try to explain to me that what critical race theory means is that white people are uncomfortable with the fact that we're not going to be in a white-majority nation forever. That's not what critical race theory means. They just invoke that. And then what does it say? Along with that, we, which has no relevance to freaking anything here, uh, is also the reality that an increasing number of school-aged children and youth 
are poor. That's a accelerate. That's the contradictions, man. We live in. We're supposed to be in an equi, uh, equal society, colorblind equality. We're supposed to have good capitalism. Everything's fair and equal. And everybody has their fundamental rights, etc. Blah blah blah. And capitalism produces a lot of richness. We're, we're supposed to have no racism in a colorblind society. But look at how there are these differences in outcomes. There are still poor people. There are still people experiencing racism. There are still differences in outcomes on average, which they don't want to explain. In the words of Ibram Kendi, they're going to say that differences in outcomes on average. In other words, in inequities, racial inequity is going to be taken. This is directly from the words of Ibram Kendi for his fucking constitutional amendment he wants for anti-racism, that uh, in racial inequities are going to be taken as a proof of racial discrimination, which will then invoke all of the power of civil rights legislation to try to fix it. That's what that's about. This is a Marxist manipulation of the worst kind, and it will tear apart the fabric of our society, and they're just trying to justify brainwashing your kids with this awful program. That's what this is about. Racial and ethnic inequalities in, sorry, you know, it says inequalities in education are linked with other inequities. There's a little shift such as health and wealth. So we have to have health equity. Remember this racism is a public health threat tucked right in there and wealth. So this really is about communism, isn't it? Such as health and wealth and thereby com uh, compromises the life chances of these children and youth. Oh my gosh, you're either going to have anti-racist education or you're going to have dead black kids. So they invoke this exaggerated uh, sense of, of alarm here. Um, this ultimately undermines the vitality of their communities and threatens the nation's security, productivity, and standing in global community. What? Okay, they just say that. They just assert it. There's not even a citation. Standing in global community? That, first of all, there's something grammatically wrong there. But standing in global community, what? Well, I mean, this is just like where Derek Bell argued that the communists were successfully uh, recruiting in the 1950s off of the fact that there's discrimination in the United States. And so what they're saying is that the enemies of the United States are going to be able to point and say, look, the United States is still so racist. China's doing that right now. And so we've got to think of ourselves as members of a broad global community. Maybe we can be global citizens, in fact, in that broad global community, which has a weird global sovereign if we're global citizens somehow, and we have to care about our standing in that. So this is why we have to implement these programs. Addressing this matter adequately is a pressing and intergenerational endeavor. They're playing to win, baby. Intergenerational endeavor. They will fuck over your kids and use those kids to fuck over their kids more and use those kids to fuck over their kids even more. It will require children youth, and adults from advantaged and disadvantaged racial ethnic groups and backgrounds to be constructively engaged in the pursuit of excellence in academic, social, and emotional development. Everybody got to be a Marxist. Everybody's got to be allies. This article is derived in part from a larger scan of the literature that Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL, C-A-S-E-L, CASEL.org, is conducting... Such scans are done periodically to guide updates to CASEL tools and resources. The ongoing effort is anchored in CASEL's current strategic foci of equity, adult SEL, and, in and integration of academic and SEL instruction. Again, they're going to re replace tons of actual academic instruction with in the schools with this Marxist grooming. That's integration. They're going to integrate it into all the academic subjects. Your math class is going to conclude SEL. In fact, they are, it already does. Your kid's math class already has this in it. Science class is going to have SEL in it. it. All is going to be geared more and more toward this. This is where, in say, race Marxism, when I get to the fifth chapter where I talk about how critical race theory works, and I explain they only do one thing. They only operate to make more critical race theorists. That's the only thing critical race theory does in practice is try to make more critical race theorists. Not about educating your kids. It's about using every possible institution, opportunity, and resource to grind your kids into a racial critical consciousness. And that's what they're saying with this integrate crap. SEL is a nightmare. It has been hijacked at best and was a Trojan horse from the beginning at worst and has absolutely no place in our schools. Policymakers need to understand this and need to get this stuff burned out of our school systems all the way through. And parents, in the meantime, need to be getting your kids away from this. If it means taking your kids out of school, it means taking your kids out of school. They have to be taken away from this. This is the worst kind of Maoist and Marxist grooming you can imagine. 
and it's going to complete, they're not going to be academically prepared in anything, and they're going to become out Marxist activists if they're exposed to this. They're going to, they're going to be groomed into this cult, which is a purely destructive, hateful cult that hates this country, hates your parents, that's you, they hate you, your kids hate you if they go through this, hate the faiths, hate everything, except integrating Marxism for transformative change, like good little change agents that they're being made into. And it's going to be in every possible subject. We seek further, they say, uh, we seek to further advance this work in several ways. First, we articulate the cultural, the, the castle work. First, we articulate the cultural and historical context for understanding the relationship between SEL and equity. In other words, why we need it to be a Marxist form of SEL. Uh, in addition, we employ notions of democracy and citizenship to help further frame the concept of transformative SEL. Remember that democracy and the citizenship are going to be viewed. Global citizen is the big keyword here for citizenship. We have to think of ourselves as global citizens in a global community with a global oligarchy that's going to tell us how to think under ESG. The S of ESG, as a matter of fact. Um, but uh, I lost my train of thought. I got so excited. But no, democracy means communism. Because if there is inequity, if there's differences in, in, in privilege, if there's differences in, in resources, if there's differences in, in wealth, then people don't have equal voice. So we don't have true democracy. So we employ notions of democracy and citizenship to help further frame the concept of transformative, aka Marxist SEL. Third, we discuss how expressions of culture, identity, agency, belonging, and engagement can fit within the five buckets rep represented by the Castle five core competencies. In other words, they're going to take Castle, which is already a Marxist hijacking of SEL, and they're going to turn it into transformative SEL by twisting it even further into identity Marxism, woke Marxism. We're going to retool those five buckets within the castle model and make sure those core competencies express transformative, in other words, Marxist SEL through and through. So it represented by the five, the castle five core competencies in, them, in themselves have the potential to compose transformative social and emotional competencies. We then point to programs and practices that hold promise for cultivating and integrating these transformative competencies in the context of academic learning. In, so academic learning is going to become the vehicle for this indoctrination or programming. In doing so, we highlight the importance of professional development that includes adult SEL to make th these efforts maximally effective for diverse children and youth. That's going to be indoctrinating teachers, but also parents to make sure that the lessons really stick. So the next section is situating equity in SEL in a cultural and historical content. Historical is another one of those words. Are they actually talking about history? Hmm, probably not. It's a Marxist word. They think that they have the true study of history, and the history is the history of social relations, which are determined by power, power dynamics that characterize how society is structured. In the United States, they tell us, and many other westernized societies, westernized, again a verb, there are dominant cultural themes of individualism and materialism that suggest that the primary meaning of maturity, success, and happiness is defined as being, quote, self-sufficient, autonomous, and financially well-off. They're about to tell us that the American dream is a, uh, and that the goal to be a stable, a member of the stable middle class, or even, you know, maybe further up to climb the, the climb the, the 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 ladder of society that that's an ideology perpetuated by the elites by the bourgeoisie to justify why there is an equity in society at all although this orientation they say has brought about technological advances that improve the basic material conditions for many it also fosters elevated levels of greed avarice utilitarianism and unethical behaviors capitalism bad this has in turn, and remember, the maturity, success, and happiness are defined as self-sufficient, autonomous, financially well-off. That's the thing they're attacking. Self-sufficient rather than collectivist, autonomous rather than collectivist, and financially well-off instead of communist, dirt poor, and starving. This has in turn brought about the concentration of wealth in the hands of a decreasing percentage of people across the globe, a shrinking middle class, and an expanding number of working poor and poor. This is communism, baby. 
The inequities and sense of unrealized material aspirations and socioeconomic precarity have social and emotional implications such as self-destructive, for example, substance abuse and suicide, and internecine conflict and violence, for example, verbal and physical bullying and mass shootings, that's pretty extreme, that are widespread but most pronounced among boys and men of color from under-resourced communities and increasingly by low-income and working-class white men. Okay, so framing out what's going on here, they're blaming all of these ills in society on capitalism. And then by bringing up uh, boys and men of color and from underserved communities, they're also going to implicate racism as a form of cultural capitalism, which is uh, exactly something Ibram Kendi says kind of a lot. Uh, further, this cultural orientation helped launch sustain and exacerbate long-standing racial class and gender gender stereotypes that define prevailing notions of in-groups out-group relations these stereotypes further inequities by allowing dominant groups especially upper income white people to affix blame on the disadvantaged for their life circumstances that's your so-called victim blaming saying that if they worked harder they wouldn't be poor if they took responsibility, if they found a way to, to do something productive with life, they wouldn't be poor. It's No, it's supposed to be the whole social structure and whole social system. So SEL is meant to, transformative SEL is meant to transform your children into people who, following Paulo Freire's model of education, are going to realize that their dependency is caused by the whole of society that they must rebel against. It's Marxism. And who are they blaming? Who are the scapegoats? Especially upper income white people. Uh, to affix blame on, dis on the disadvantage for their life circumstances, justify unearned privilege, and engage in dehumanization, commodification, and marginalization of large segments of the domestic and international populations. That's not really how that works, but okay. Schools, like other mainstream U.S. cultural institutions, tend to reproduce these social arrangements. This is Marxism. This is this is Antonio Gramsci's cultural Marxism. The schools, like the other institutions, reproduce the existing social relations, so they have to insert themselves into those existing institutions, transform them with a counter-hegemonic view from within, in other words, turn them Marxist, and then you can overthrow the society. Why do you need transformative SEL in the schools? That's why. So you can make your kids a little Gramscian cultural Marxist activist, in other words, a red guard, because the saying is that Mao did what Gramsci thought, whether he read him or not. They prioritize, that's uh, these social arrangements, they're being reproduced, they prioritize prevailing middle-class American culture and can be thought of as offering a culturally relevant education, CRE, for white middle-income children and youth, but by implication, nobody else. And so the only people, what they're saying is that, that the, the educational system is only set up for certain people and it screws over everybody else and it reproduces, whether it's capitalist oppression, whether it's critical race theory style, racial oppression, et cetera, uh, gender oppression. Uh, the only kids who actually are white middle, only white middle income children and youth are the ones who actually obtain a culturally relevant education and everybody else is getting screwed over uh, because the system, the educational system is actually secretly prioritizing by trying to be objective or whatever else. It is actually prioritizing middle-class American culture and thus reproducing that and all of its problems as far as the Marxists see it. And remember, the Marxists really hate middle-class American culture because it's so stable and so strong that it prevents Marxism because nobody wants to lose a good life in the pursuit of a Marxist unicorn that's not going to come about. Student success, they say, is narrowly defined in these terms, meaning white middle-class uh, American culture. So student success is narrowly defined in these terms, so now we're going to have different assessments, et cetera, because we have to define success differently, like by turning them into activists. That's very successful. And variations from these normative patterns can result in culturally and linguistic, linguistically diverse students being met with unwarranted low expectations, iron law of oak projection, experiences of cultural mismatch, discrimination, microaggressions, which are basically not real, and implicit biases by peers and adults also basically not real. These can be traumatic experiences. That's an overblown word, so they can justify a psychological intervention by people who aren't qualified to do one in settings that they shouldn't be doing them. 
These can be traumatic experiences, which di- that's your create vulnerability so you can induce kids into a cult by giving them a doctrine that lets them become little uh, change agents who are going to change the system so that nobody has to suffer that anymore and they can feel good about themselves as change agents. These can be traumatic experiences which divert students' cognitive resources from learning, as if becoming fucking activists doesn't divert their res- cognitive at- resources from learning. Iron Law of Oak Projection never misses. These students are also offered suboptimal learning opportunities that include less feedback and the offering of curricula that require more rote memorization, is less demanding and engaging, and is less reflective of their community and culture. Yet again, Latinx, really? Latinx? Less reflective of their community and culture. You're the people pushing Latinx. Iron Law of Woke Projection never, ever ever misses. So the students are given suboptimal learning opportunities. So some of this is probably actually true. So you can see again, just like in the culturally responsive education uh, or culturally relevant education uh, paper we read in the previous podcast, they're taking something that has a little bit of truth to it and then blowing it way out of proportion to justify a Marxist takeover of the educational program. Relatedly, they tell us, opportunity gaps are greater in schools where black and Latino middle school students report more discrimination, feeling less safe and connected with adults and having fewer opportunities to participate. So let me just talk for uh, one more second of less reflective of their community and culture since I mentioned Latinx and uh, we've now invoked Latino middle school students. I had this experience. I went, speaking of schools, to the Orange County, California School Board and it was testified in one of their meetings about critical race theory and its damage and the opposition side, the woke side, got to invite somebody to come in. And it's this pastor, local pastor, their woke pastor, I guess. And he's all about ethnic studies. He, he's positive about critical race theory. And in the middle of his like pro-woke rant as a Latino, he's a Latino pastor, he goes off about all of the queer indoctrination. Like, that's not cool, right? He's really pissed about that and says, that's really dangerous. And then ethnic studies, et cetera, is good. So we're talking about making sure that what, what do they say? Uh, that, that what's happening in the schools existing, not under the woke stuff, but in the existing schools is that the curriculum is, uh, less reflective of their community and culture. I remember that even the school board member who invited the woke pastor, basically, I don't, I don't think she physically did, but she may have actually put her hand on her face. Uh, it was just really bad because for, for the woke side of the argument, because he absolutely took the queer theory aspect of this and gender theory aspect of this and just blew it up and said it was terrible, like really went off about it. And why? Because it's not actually reflective of Latino culture to do Latinx bullshit or to get into a bunch of queer theory grooming of your kids. They're actually pretty socially conservative in general, and they don't want their kids groomed into sec- perverted sexual shit by white people at schools. And yet again, the Iron Law of Oak projection prevails. And the Iron Law of Oak projection, that projection is the just these things that they claimed, which are taken way out of context and ignore the fact that they're also doing the same thing. It uses a justification for this Marxist program in the schools. For youth of color, they tell us low-income youth and immigrant youth, the prevailing social arrangements can induce acculturative stress, stereotype threat. I think that's actually been debunked, by the way. Alienation, institutional mistrust, and disengagement, which, by the way, Iron Law of Oak Projection hits again. Really? Alienation, institutional mistrust, and disengagement? We just talked about how it does, they, they, they do that, whether it's through Latinx and this queer stuff with the Latino cultures, or if we want to talk about it, you know, it turns out that scapegoating white kids and scapegoating the well-off and making people be in groups that are collaborative learning, collectivist learning environments, does all of those things. Induces acculturative stress, stereotype threat, not those two. Alienation, yes. Institutional mistrust, yes. And disengagement, absolutely. Iron Law Work Projection never misses, which undermines success in schools and hamper young people in assuming constructive roles in family, workplace, and community context. Now, pause again. Hamper young people in assuming, da, da, da. oh, sorry, undermine success in school. Remember, this. Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter discussion that we had earlier with the idea of all being a woke word with a hidden agenda. The assumption is that you can't actually alienate the privileged kids because the society is already constructed for them. And so doing something that alienates them 
or that disengages them or that causes institutional mistrust in them is actually them having a white fragility reaction. It's actually indication of the problem. It's actually something that they have to be put into increased discomfort through the pedagogy of discomfort to correct. And that's part of your social emotional learning is making the so-called privileged kids uncomfortable because it's good for their social and emotional learning to equitabilize their, to equitize, I guess, their fucking privilege. It's demented. This is, these people belong in prison and they just write this. And if you know what you're reading, it's like, this is, this is them writing their own confession for why they should go to prison. This is all justifying psychological abuse to turn children, not to, 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 to fail to educate children instead to turn them into change agents for a horrific ideology that is actually causing the depression, anxiety, etc., that's ruining them uh, psychologically in schools. Of course, when all that happens, they can blame it on the system and the racism, etc., and they can use that to justify doing even more of this snake oil-based abuse. People implementing social-emotional learning belong in prison. But they tell us this serves to help reproduce or exacerbate existing educational or economic inequities. No, it doesn't. No, it actually doesn't. You're doing exactly the opposite. Thus, it is necessary to consider a form of SEL that transforms individuals. Uh Uh-oh, transforms individuals. This is some Marxist religion stuff. Go back and listen to that podcast. That transforms individuals' interactions and institutions in ways that support optimal human development and functioning. Human development, Hannah Dyer, no stable identity. Optimal human development and functioning for young people and adults regardless of circumstances or background transforms individuals, interactions, and institutions. Remember that Robin D'Angelo said that you can't have a cross-racial relationship that doesn't constantly engage racism and have it be authentic? There's your transformed interactions. That's what they're going to teach your kids to do all the time. Isn't that wonderful? Instead of what? Learning to sit there frankly and shut the fuck up and learn some math. They don't have to actually shut up. They should be asking intelligent questions, engaging with the material, going to the board and getting embarrassed because they don't know what they're doing. Like everybody gets to go through. It actually builds character. They don't want to build character. They want to create change agents, entitled change agents who think that society should serve them. And so, you know, you have people of different backgrounds in the class. Or we're going to make the whole class be about engaging that difference. And the, how would you, how would your people learn mathematics? How would your people think about this mathematics problem? How can this mathematics topic serve people in your community? And that's your math class now. And you're talking about politics instead of basic arithmetic or algebra or whatever it happens to be. Section, outlining transformative SEL and associated social and emotional competencies, citizenship as a framing issue. This is going to be rich. The current Castle framework for systemic SEL includes core social and emotional competencies, developmental contexts, and short-term and long-term outcomes. See figure one. We'll come back to figure one. Actually, no, let's go see figure one. We'll come back to this. Figure one is a classic graphic. I don't have it here that shows what Castle's all about. Framework for systemic school and district SEL. It says on the left, it has this kind of vertical bar how district and school theories of action. One, build foundational support plan for SEL. Two, strengthen adult SEL knowledge, competencies, and capacity. Three, promote SEL for students. Four, use data for continuous improvement. And they're going to do that through theory. So what we're really saying is theory and praxis. This has a right arrow to this circle that says the five areas, what and where, uh, in this complicated circle diagram. At the very center is social emotional learning, SEL. Then there are five core pillars, like I said, or five core competencies, like they've talked about self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. You can hear where some of this self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, uh, those three are all going to be ripe for any of the critical theories of identity. Self-management, they're going to tell people how they're supposed to feel about their kids, how they're supposed to feel about things. Responsible decision-making, well, if their goal is to make your kids into change agents, they get to define responsible, and that's not that good. Around that, they have, for the classroom, SEL curriculum and instruction to achieve this. Around that, in the level of the schools, they have climate, is this a climate? School-wide practices and policies, so they're going to have you know, control over school-wide practices and policies. And then around that, families and communities are supposed to offer support through family and community partnerships where now adults are supposed to become indoctrinated in this and become allies. Why? On the right-hand column, they have student outcomes or why. In the short term, 
social and emotional skills, improved attitudes about self, others, and tasks, perceived classroom uh, and school climate, intermediate, positive social behaviors and relationships, academic success, fewer conduct problems. Is that working, by the way? Has restorative justice making classroom problems get better or worse? Worse. Way worse. No discipline. Why? Because students and teachers are supposed to be seen on equal levels of authority. So there's complete madness. No uh, n- no control, absolutely. No classroom discipline. Teachers are quitting left, right, and center because they can do nothing about classroom management, classroom discipline. Uh, anyway, less emotional distress, false. Less drug use, well, I couldn't tell you. Long-term goals, high school graduation. College career readiness. Safe sexual behaviors. Kind of weird they stuck that one in there, isn't it? Healthy relationships, not their purview, really. Mental health, how's that working out for them? Reduced criminal behavior, well, if you don't put anybody in jail, I guess you get it by default, but, uh, and engaged citizenship, which engaged here means that you're a fucking Marxist, so as a citizen, you are trying to overthrow the existing society. That's good to know. That's By the way, that's Henry Giroux's whole point about engaged citizenship and democracy mean. So if you read Henry Giroux, which we haven't done here in the series yet, he actually makes that point that we want to create engaged democratic citizens and defines them as people who are doing Marxist transformational work in society. So that's what this castle framework is about, as we can see in figure one, when you understand what you're reading. They say engaged citizenship appears as a long-term developmental outcome. I'm telling you, it means being a Marxist to overthrow society. We resonate with this idea as an informed and educated and engaged populace is vital to individual well-being. Why? Because individual well-being is reflective of the collective taking care of them because you're a Marxist and the health of democratic societies. Why? Because democratic societies depend on there being equity or communism before they're truly democratic. I'm This is literally Henry Drew's point. He's not cited here, but I bet you one of these papers, or if we track back not very far, we're going to get to a Henry Drew paper or book explaining these ideas, because that's all he talks about, say, in On Critical Pedagogy from 2011, which you can go read for yourself. I'll read it eventually, or some of it here on the podcast. In their work on the role of teachers in U.S. education, Mira and Morrell from 2011 drew a useful distinction between neoliberal and critical democracy. Well, see what I'm telling you? Neoliberal democracy versus critical democracy. If we have to have critical democracy, I guarantee you engaged citizenship means you are engaging in critical democracy, which means you are being a Marxist using so-called social Democrat methods to try to overthrow society for socialism on its way to communism. Drew a useful distinction between neoliberal and critical democracy and offered implications for education. Briefly, they argued that the education aimed at promoting personally responsible citizenship and its attendant individualism, consumerism, and passivity accords with a dominant neoliberal democracy. This is the dominant model. However, a critical democracy requires education to have collectivism, produce interactionism, and authentic engagement as its goals. Marxism. Accordingly, the field of SEL could aim to prepare students for not only engaged but also critical citizenship. What does that mean? It means being a Marxist social democrat who's going to try to overthrow society to create socialism on its way to communism. In other words, a Marxist activist. Engaged, but also critical citizenship. In other words, being a Marxist. To further illustrate, it is useful to consider models of citizenship implied by these different models of democracy. For example, Banks 2017 provided a citizenship topology that ranges from failed citizenship to transformative citizenship for transformative SEL. Failed citizenship captures when domestic or immigrant individuals or groups feel structurally excluded from and ambivalent toward the nation state and do not internalize its values or ethos. So it's only about um, immigrants. (laughs) or I guess domestic or immigrants, is it only it, when, when you have structural inequality and it, the domestic and immigrant individuals and groups feel structurally excluded because of Marxist analysis, convincing them that they feel that way, then they're going to have ambivalent blah, blah, blah. That's failed citizenship. Rather, they focus on their group identity and political efficacy to achieve structural inclusion. Recognized citizenship applies to individuals and groups who the nation state recognizes as legitimate and valued members. They have whiteness. They have rights and opportunity, but are not required to fully civically engage. 
Participatory citizens have recognized citizenship and engage minimally through, for example, voting. These three forms of citizenship are encompassed and help define the social hierarchy within neoliberal democracy. Within neoliberal democracy frame, there's a lot of grammatical errors in this for an education paper. Transformative citizenship is the type most closely aligned with critical democracy, as it refers to actions taken to advance policies or social changes that are consistent with human rights, social justice, and equality. In other words, Marxism. Transformative citizenship is for critical democracy, which is Marxism. That's what I just said. It's Marxism. Such efforts might be consistent with or violate existing local, state, and national laws. Let that one sit with you for a second. Transformative citizenship might be inconsistent with or violate existing state, local, state, and national laws. So you're going to have to change the law, obviously, so that you can have more Marxism. Imagine advocating for a program as the pinnacle of what citizenship means. And it means that you have to engage in practices that violate the laws of that society. That's your transformative SEL, babes. That's what we're up against. That's what this is. It has to be taken. These people belong in fucking prison. This, of course, by their magic sauce, which means not throwing anybody in jail, is going to reduce imprisonment, remember? It was going to reduce criminality, or whatever it is, reduced criminal behavior that's on the list. Westheimer and uh, Kahn-E, K-A-H-N-E, I don't know. Westheimer and Kahn's 2004 typology does not include failed citizenship, but nevertheless corresponds with the bank's notion of recognized participatory and transformative citizenship. Westheimer and Kahn also suggested that citizenship and civic education can take three forms. Personally responsible, participatory, or justice-oriented. <laughs> Here's your communism. Personally responsible and participatory citizenship are not inconsistent with neoliberal democracy. In brief, the personally responsible citizen is thought to exemplify good character by displaying pro-social attitudes and behaviors, and these youth often promote the common good, for example, by being helpful in their local community in a general sense. The participatory citizen is actively involved in extant civic life through particular local clubs, traditional clubs and civic organizations, social institutions, and political activities. Finally, justice-oriented citizenship is concerned with institutional and system change efforts and is consistent with critical democracy. It's Marxism. If we understand SEL to be part of the civic development process, so you're going to shape what a good citizen is. Remember that one of the things that critical pedagogy is about is destroying the hidden curriculum where the schools passively reproduce the existing uh, cultural model, which they see as bad and depressive. And so you have to expose the hidden curriculum and get rid of it. And what they're doing instead is it deliberately installing a uh, hidden curriculum that turns your kids into Marxists. If we understand SEL to be part of the civic development process, then we can characterize it in terms of the extent to which it is personally responsible, participatory, and transformative justice oriented. Equally important, each form of SEL has implications for issues of social justice, which itself is a multifaceted concept. So everything's too complicated, don't worry. We're not going to look too close. Interpersonal justice, for instance, is consistent with personally responsible SEL. So that's Personally responsible SEL is where you might engage, engage with individuals and teach them responsibility so that they can climb out of their dependency. And that it refers to fairness in everyday informal interactions. Procedural and retributive justice refer to rules that guide decision making and thus correspond with participatory SEL. Participatory SEL may also correspond to restorative justice as it suggests a collaborative process whereby perpetrator and victim reconcile and reestablish a sense of justice. Now, restorative justice is something that contextually is appropriate at some points. So you have mediation, people who have wronged one another work it out, and they try to do restoration to the damage that was done, retributive justice, or retributive or, or procedural. That's the kind of like classic discipline that's going on. What do you see where restorative justice is implemented? You see chaos. You see kids with absolutely no discipline whatsoever. It's 
get rid of the police and send in the social workers is what it is. And while social workers are great in certain circumstances, they're really bad when the police are what are actually needed. Same thing here. If you shift into restorative justice in your schools, when you need something that works like actual discipline, it doesn't work. It's a fantasy that everybody's just going to be able to reconcile. And that if you probably by showing people how some structural power dynamic was the cause of their dis disagreement, if you can shame the privileged kid and elevate the so-called oppressed kid, then you can restore the situation and reestablish a, a reconcile the situation and uh, reestablish a sense of justice. It's collaborative too. That's great. Collectivist. All for one, one for all, just like in communism. In contrast to all of these strand, sorry, in contrast to all of these stands distributive justice, which refers to the ways in which valued goods and services, for example, power, knowledge, and material power being first, very interesting, and material resources are allocated equitably. <laughs> Redistribution of resources, power, knowledge, and material resources are going to be redistributed. That's distributive justice. We view transformative SEL as most aligned with this type of social justice. Of course you do, because it's communism. Pursuing social justice implies resistance to oppressive circumstances or relations. Solarsano and Delgado Bernal, 2001. I think this is Daniel Solarsano, who is a major education um, critical race theorist, because critical race theory is definitely a part of this, of course. Solarsano and Delgado, and I don't know if this Delgado Bernal that's hyphenated um, is related to Richard Delgado or not, so we won't make any assumptions, just to point that out in case anybody is. I don't know any relationship there. I didn't look offered that resistance to oppression can be self-defeating, reactionary, conformist, and or transformational. Pivotal considerations among these are the degree and nature of one's critique of existing social arrangements and striving for social justice. Failed citizenship can prompt reactionary and self-defeating forms of resistance, which differ slightly with regard to the level of system critique. So if you're not doing Marxism, you have a failed citizen probably, but neither is motivated by social justice. No, nope, that's not good for them. Viewed through the lens of Solarsano and Delgado Bernal's work, we can understand personally responsible and participatory SEL to be that which aligns with the conformist resistance that offers limited or no system critique and is motivated by surviving within the existing social order. In other words, maintaining the status quo even where it's oppressive and teaching kids to survive within the oppressive system instead of teaching them to overthrow it. This is Paulo Freire through and through. Paulo Freire's basic model of education is that you're going to teach the peasants or you're going to teach the children that they are dependent in the existing system rather than teaching them personal responsibility, which is literally being personally responsible. SEL is being incriminated here uh, rather than teaching them responsibility as a pathway out of dependency. You're going to teach them collectivism and that the system is the problem and that they can work collectively to overthrow the existing social order. Otherwise, you're going to bring them into a situation where they have to survive within the existing social order, either by staying as the lower class and having strategies to deal with it, or by working their way out of the ghetto or working their way off of the mountain, if you're in Appalachia, so we don't make that too racial, and thus betraying it and becoming part of the oppressor class and just reproducing the domination on your former fellows rather than staying in solidarity with them. Collective guilt is weaponized. Indeed, personally responsible and participatory forms of SEL can facilitate assimilation and or acculturation among immigrant groups, for example. Those are being framed out as though they are bad. Both societal arrangements assume uncritically the superiority, see, of U.S., uh, mainstream culture and require compliance and subservience from the disadvantaged for social acknowledgement and limited access to valued resources. So you, if you're black, you don't have access to whiteness, so you have to act white if you want to have uh, social advantage. That's the veiled version of what they're saying. Um, in contrast, transformative SEL is consistent with transformal, transformational resistance as it features a system critique and is motivated by distributive social justice. In other words, it's Marxist. And it's proceeding exactly along the model outlined in the first chapter of Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It prepares youth, to, which is a Marxist education book that's taken over education system. This is what SEL is about, gang. 
It prepares youth to analyze and oppose the reality that those rights and responsibilities are denied to some segments of the population, which of course is a histrionic reading of what's really going on, and encourages disenfranchised groups to strive for self-determination within the democratic project. They don't tell you how, but it's through a meaningful politic of identity, as Kimberly Crenshaw would have it, which takes identity uh, as a anchor of subjectivity and a fruitful site for that identity politic. And that anchor of subjectivity means that it's going to be done in a Marxist regard. These proposed forms of SEL, personally responsible, participatory, and transformative, thus have associated competencies and programmatic implications. Next, we first illustrate what we mean by transformative social and emotional competencies in particular before pointing out or before pointing to classroom-based programs and approaches, which will be summarized in Table 2, the whole promise for cultivating such competencies in, competencies in students and adults. What they do in Table 2, which is actually, uh, sorry, there are two tables here, Table 1 and Table 2. What they do in Table 2 is actually very short. What they do in Table 1 is a tentative list of relevant concepts and constructs for forms of social and emotional learning, and they break down the five categories of CASTLE, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, and compare personally responsible, participatory, and transformative approaches to SEL according to these. So let's take a look at these. So under self-awareness, they ascribe to personally responsible SEL acquisitive uh, individualism, identity, which under that includes private regard, exploration, and resolution. But in participatory SEL, they say there's communal or orientation instead of individualism. Identity is put in terms of private regard, exploration, and resolution still as well. But in transformative SEL, you have communal orientation, like in participatory. And identity is framed in terms of centrality, private regard, exploration, and rev resolution. So what they've added in is centrality, which is going to be some key phrase, but they also have added in within self-awareness, critical self-analysis. So self-awareness is going to be that you're going to have to do the work on yourself, just like white fragility says. You're going to have to interrogate your own identity according to critical self-analysis. So according to critical theories of identity, according to woke Marxism. Uh, what centrality means here is not actually explicated, so we'll leave it be. Under the heading of self-management, we see personally responsible approaches have emotion-focused coping, and under the topic of agency, they focus on resilience and social efficacy, but in participatory, you have emotion-focused coping, and under agency, we see not just resilience and social efficacy, but also civic efficacy. So now you have to pair, care about what's going on. It's not about you. It's about the civic, your participatory in the civic arena. So you're going to care about civic efficacy. And then in transformative, we're no longer emotion-focused coping. We're problem-focused coping because it's about problematics. And we're not going to worry so much about, literally, agency is removed and is replaced with cultural humility, which is this idea that we are going to bow down bet before the... Uh, cultural Marxist or identity Marxist interpretations of identities or cultures rooted in identity and analyze them in terms of their structural meaning as the Marxist would. And that includes agency resistance instead of resilience, moral, civic efficacy, and collective efficacy. So it's not just enough to be civically engaged, you have to be collectivist as well. It's going to induce more morality cult, uh, consistent with cultural humidity, humility. All of this is going to be rooted in diversity, equity, and inclusion models then. And resistance replaces resilience. You're no longer going to be resilient in a system that's tough on you. You're going to be resistant to it. And agency is no longer the central thing. The cultural humility, the Marxist program is an agency, like I've said repeatedly, is tucked within it. You aren't being agentic in woke Marxism unless you are going along with the woke Marxist program, because otherwise you have false consciousness, internalized dominance, internalized racism, internalized sexism, internalized misogyny, internalized transphobia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Marxism, Marxism, Marxism. Social awareness. Under personally responsible, there's public regard and belonging, and belonging means access. When we move to participatory, there's public regard and belonging, but belonging now doesn't mean access, it means inclusion. And there's also diversity, salience, in situational contexts. So now we've moved into the inclusion model, which means that people will not be offended out. 
according to structural analyses. But when we move over to transformative, we have public regard and belonging. But in belonging, we've replaced inclusion with co-owner. Everybody's a co-owner because it's collectivist. We've now added also diversity, salience, that's both situational and institutional. And we've added in critical social analysis. In other words, critical theory. In other words, woke Marxism. That's part of social awareness. Relationship skills. So now we're down. Relationship skills and responsible decision making were the two before of the five castle pillars that I said are least wor- worry- worrisome, right? The least woke, the least wokeable. The other three, you, and I already just explained exactly where they tuck it in in transformative SEL, where they tuck the woke stuff in, woke Marxism. Well, relationship skills and personally uh, responsible decision making are the, the ones that you think, well, those surely are the least bad. No, well, then maybe they're the least bad, but just listen. They, they get it in there too. So under personally responsible relationship skills, so we're just talking about relationship skills across the three, personally responsible approach has engagement, sharing, and helping. Okay, engagement, sharing, and helping, those are things that you do in a personally responsible kind of teamwork-oriented mentality. Under participatory, you have engagement, sharing, helping, but also cultural competence, which is that thing in the culturally relevant teaching that we never actually heard what it means, but it seems to be indulging stereotypes. And never stepping upon saying, you know, never doing a cultural appropriation, never uh, suggesting that one cultural approach might be superior to another. When we get to transformative SEL under relationship skills, we still have engagement, we still have sharing, we still have helping, but now we have multicultural competence because regular cultural competence isn't sufficient and collaborative problem solving and leadership. Leadership, of course, is going to be turning yourself into a little uh, red guard little commissar, collaborative problem solving. So now we're not going to solve problems individually anymore with relationship skills. We're going to come together and have like a group therapy session together. Then SEL is going to be the tool being applied by somebody who shouldn't be applying it, namely a teacher that went through a short course that they were mandated to do in order to do it. And in states like North Carolina, they changed the law so that the teachers applying psychological tools in group settings where they shouldn't be doing it without a license to practice psychology or the necessary professional or educational background to do it can't be held liable for any psychological damage they do to your children. That's how insidious this is. Under responsible decision-making, personally responsible SEL cares about interpersonal justice, acculturation, and personal well-being. Versus in participatory SEL, it's procedural justice, assimilation, and a collective well-being. Not personal well-being, collective well-being. Not acculturation, but assimilation. And not interpersonal justice. We're going to work it out between us, but procedural justice. We're going to use some civic process. But in transformative SEL for responsible decision-making, we're going to use distributive justice, pluralism, which is really multiculturalism for them, and collective well-being. So the collectivism makes its way in. How is this all supposed to be done in classroom-based programs and approaches in Table 2? Uh, This is examples of programs and approaches to forms of social and emotional learning, examples for personally responsible approaches, skill development like risk prevention and competence promotion. Sounds good. Participatory would include classroom community building, getting weird, multicultural education, wasting time for a failed project, and service learning. In other words, you're going to, I think that's going to mean, I mean, not jump to conclusions. Service learning is going to be learning through doing service as the student. So you're going to put them into an activist role. In transformative SEL, the classroom is now going to have culturally relevant education, which we heard in the previous podcast from Gloria Lights and Billings, includes A, academic success. Yeah, right. No, no trust in that. B, um cultural competence, which she never defines, but again, sounds like stereotypes and uh, never doing a cultural appropriation or a microaggression or whatever. Uh, And C, raising critical consciousness and engaging in activism. So culturally relevant education is straight up critical Marxist pedagogy, Uh, project-based learning. So there's a different way of going about learning. You're going to do it through projects now. You're not going to sit there and learn lessons. And youth participatory action research, which is going to be learning through activism. That's your youth participatory action research. Sounds like brown shirts to me. Summarizing transformative social and emotional competencies. 
That's the next section. The Castle 5 SEL, competencies of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making represent large categories or conceptual buckets for organizing a range of intra- and interpersonal knowledge, skills, and abilities. We view these competencies as interrelated, synergistic, and integral to the growth and development of justice-oriented global citizens. Justice-oriented means communist. Global citizens means... There's some global government that provides uh, either rights or privileges that we are all uh, that that does that does the securing of or granting of those rights or privileges for all of the citizens of the globes. We don't we don't have that, and we don't want that. We do not want a gl- one global government because it's going to be a freaking nightmare. Uh, it is a massive centralization of power. It's also a eternal, from the very beginning, Marxist goal that they would have one global justice-oriented government, and everybody would be global citizens within the communist utopia that it produces. Next, we provide revisions to the current definitions of each competency domain through an equity lens, building on what we have referred to elsewhere as equity elaborations referring to their own paper, Yeager's et al., 2018. Bullet point. Competence in the self-awareness domain involves understanding one's emotions, personal and social identities. Uh Uh-oh, social identities, personal identities even. Goals and values. This includes accurately assessing one's strengths and limitations, having positive mindsets, and that's your self-esteem movement, and possessing a well-grounded sense of self-efficacy and optimism. Maybe. High levels of self-awareness require the ability to recognize one's own biases. So now it's going to be critical theory. To understand the links between one's personal and collective history and identities. So now we're going to do uh, that. We're going to do identity-based collectivism. And we're going to understand the links between one's personal and collective history and identities. How did the structural forces throughout history that create social relations that created who you are today based on your group identity, straight up Marxist identity, Marxist analysis, and to recognize how thoughts, feelings, and actions are interconnected in across diverse contexts. Competence in the self-management, new bullet point, self-management domain requires skills and attitudes that facilitate the ability to regulate emotions and behaviors. This includes the ability to delay gratification, manage stress, and control impulses through problem-focused coping. Okay, probably not the teacher's job if there's a big problem there. Useful when it's a psychologist dealing with a kid who's having a problem. Some range is fine. You can see how it's going to be applying psychology where it doesn't belong by somebody who shouldn't be doing it, though, when it's done in the classroom or group or the entire school setting. It also implies appropriate expressiveness, perseverance, and being agentic in addressing personal and group level challenges to achieve self and collectively defined goals and objectives. So you hear again the collectivism and the group identity based, which is going to be structural, which is going to be Marx, identity Marxist uh, piece being brought in. Competence, new bullet point, and the social awareness domain involves having the critical historical grounding Marxist Identity Marxist analysis, having the critical historical grounding to take the perspective of those with the same and different backgrounds and cultures and to appropriately empathize and feel compassion. They're going to weaponize empathy and compassion in order to make you a Marxist. They're going to induce vulnerability and give you a way out by telling you what and how to think and feel about the lessons that they just gave, probably gratuitously violent ones about slavery and other things. They're going to tell you how you're supposed to feel so that they can induce you into a racial critical consciousness or a sexual critical consciousness or whatever, probably in age inappropriate ways. It also involves understanding social norms for constructive behavior in diverse interpersonal and institutional settings. Okay, pause. We would really want our schools to be facilitating understanding social norms for constructive behavior in general, but they don't stop there. They say where in diverse, uh uh-oh, in diverse interpersonal and institutional settings, which means that it's actually going to be how do you participate according to the strictures of the diversity and inclusion and maybe belonging demands of a diversity, equity, and inclusion and maybe belonging program. So it's your DEI is going to get applied there. How are you going to fail to do a cultural, avoid doing a, a microaggression or a cultural appropriation? How are you going to um, make sure that you engage authentically and cross 
identity interactions according to like Robin D'Angelo's model. So this is supposed to happen uh, in institutional, or sorry, interpersonal and institutional settings and recognizing family, school and community resources and supports for personal and collective well-being. Collective well-being doesn't exist, by the way. Fourth bullet point, but it's collectivism. Fourth bullet point, competence in the relationship skills domain includes the interpersonal sensibilities and facility needed to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships and effectively navigate settings with di- with differing social and cultural norms and demands. So it's going to be multicultural education. It's going to have to be culturally competent, culturally relevant, and responsive, all of that crap, which we already heard is rooted through with identity Marxism in the previous podcast. And in this one, I've said it a bunch of times. And they are going to define what maintaining healthy and rewarding relationships means, because if we remember what Robin D'Angelo tells us in White Fragility, there's no such thing as authentic engagement across races. So there's no real relationship unless it's engaging the racism that's allegedly present because of the structural nature of racism that's everywhere always and permanent. They tell us it involves, this is competence and relationship skills, involves communicating clearly, listening actively, cooperating, resisting selfishness, and inappropriate social pressure. I'm not complaining yet. Negotiating conflict constructively, seeking help and offering leadership when it is needed and working collaboratively whenever possible. Well, you don't actually have to do that part, but I get you because it's relationship skills. Competence in the responsible decision-making domain, last bullet point requires the cultivation of knowledge, skills, and attitudes to make caring, construct caring, constructive choices about personal and group behavior, always with the group stuff, always with the collectivism, because it's Marxism, and social interactions within and across diverse institutional settings. It requires, uh, there's a diverse word gets stuck in there, and you know what it means. It requires the ability to critically examine, critical gets stuck in there. It requires the ability to critically examine ethical standards, safety concerns and behavioral norms for risky behavior to make realistic evaluations of benefits and consequences of various interpersonal and institutional relationships and actions, and always to make primary collective health, always make primary collective health and well-being. So responsible decision-making, they tell us explicitly means collectivism. It also means using critical theory to determine what are good ethics, how to be safe. That's a fun word. And how to behave. Illustrating transformative social and emotional competencies. That's the next section. In this section, we highlight expressions of identity, agency, belonging, and engagement as transformative expressions of the five core castle social and emotional competencies. We offer, for example, that identity is multifaceted and reflected across competence domains. The identity is multifaceted, intersectional really, and Reflected across competence domains, identity, competence domains, okay. Agency is an important aspect of self-management and relationship skills and that belonging and engagement imply social awareness and require responsible decision-making. Section, identity. Who you are, based on both self-identification and others' perceptions, connotes relative advantage or disadvantage. It's the first thing they say about it. Understanding who you are, trying to get in touch with what it means to grow up, how you fit into the society. Nope. Connotes relative advantage or disadvantage. Straight up Marxist conflict theory. Who you are, based on both self-definition and others' perceptions, connotes relative advantage or disadvantage. Helps to inform whether citizenship is contested. That's a weird thing to be worrying about and what should be mainstream education for children. And determines the nature of one's citizenship strivings and experiences. So are you an activist? And what do you experience as a person of a particular group within the broader context of your citizenship? This implicates, and remember, we're going for global citizens where everybody's the same across the world. This implicates most directly at the castle competencies of self-awareness and social awareness, but weaves through the other competencies as well. Culture, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and gender uh, continue to be used as determinants of social status, mostly by woke Marxists, but don't let them fa- fool you with their, <laughs> with their iron law of woke projection status here, continue to be used as determinants of social status, and thus are key defining aspects of identity in the United States and across the globe. All right, let me do this some more because I just got pissed off again. They're telling us 
that what's going on is that the society at large is using culture, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and gender to determine social status. They're the same fucking people who tell us that colorblindness reproduces those problems. But at, like going out of your way not to highlight race consciousness or race or gender or whatever, to minimize their impact, to make them as irrelevant to competence as possible. They're the same fucking people telling us that if you minimize their relevance to student activities in class, we're not going to pick on the poor kid. We're not going to separate things or segregate by race. They're the same fucking people telling us that if we engage in a colorblind or a gender blind or a whatever blind method, then we're actually reproducing the problems. So we need to A, discriminate, B, be identity conscious and C, do this in this fucking Marxist way that alienates and pisses people off, that teaches kids to be oppressed or victims on the one hand, or that they are oppressors or dominators or victimizers on the other. And they're going to sit here and tell us culture, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and gender continue to be used as determinants of social status. They are, this is so Iron Law of Oak projection. It's so infuriating that they pull this crap off, that they just go off this general baseline assumption that, that, that society, which is moving, it's not perfect, but it's moved away from those kinds of things so well in advanced Western societies that it's considered shameful to engage in any of that crap. They're going to say, no, that still exists. So that's actually what's happening. The structure is still producing that. And so we're the ones that aren't doing it well all you people who are actively taking steps to minimize doing any of that crap are the ones reproducing it so we're justified in putting even more fucking marxism into your kids heads so that we can overcome that that's so infuriating that they get away with this shit so infuriating sorry i'm going full alex jones over here i'm going to be talking about satan and intercontinental aliens or something in a minute interdimensional aliens however with a few notable exceptions Notions of cultural orientation and identity have not been foregrounded in the extant SEL literature. Whoops, SEL hasn't been identity Marxist enough. We're going to have to fix that with transformative. That's what it's for, to make it more identity Marxist because we haven't done that enough because they just projected this idea that the people who are the least identity conscious and the least identity biased are actually the most because they actually are the ones who want to be identity conscious, race conscious, etc., and to push this on people and segregate in the schools, and they want to be able to continue doing it. So it must be the other people doing it. The iron law of woke projection never misses. Despite its connection to health problems, health equity, unethical behavior, and climate change, Jesus, the cultural orientation toward acquisitive individualism continues to be the dominant theme promoted within the U.S. cultural institutions, including schools. See, they're going you know, right after individualism, and they're saying, well, it causes health problems, unethical behavior, and climate change to be individuals. And that's bad, so now what do we need? We need collectivist identity Marxist shit. Other cultural orientations or values provide an alternative sense of self-other, that's just got a slash between itself or other, and are an important asset to some ethnic and racial groups, including Latino, Latinx, anybody, uh, Asian American, and African American youth. For example, a communal orientation toward one's family, ethnic, racial group, or community reduces psychological distress and risky behaviors. A communal orientation toward one's family, ethnic, or racial group, or community reduces psychological... So... Okay, being like racist makes you less psychological distress and risky behaviors and promotes a range of positive socio socio emotional and academic outcomes, including school engagement, learning of academic context and pro social behaviors. Who do they cite themselves from a previous paper? I'm sure it's just as rigorous as this. The importance of cultural orientations to the nature of competence development is supported by emerging sub by there's where are the articles in this is supported by emerging subfield of so, social effective neuroscience. Well, so let's invoke some shit they probably definitely got wrong. Uh, yeah, Imordino Young and Gottlieb. Uh, offered the evidence that feelings are cognitive interpretations of neuro-linked responses. So I'm sure this is super legitimate. Further, they presented comparative studies of culturally distinct groups that indicate that these uh, in interpretations are culturally situated and informed. 
They argued that neurobiological and socio sociocultural development are codependent, as such humans are biologically cultural, and that cultural orientation or the degree to which one embraces their culture of origin matters in this regard. So that's supposed to be the justification for why we have to be uh, racist instead of colorblind. Uh, La Framboise, I assume I said that right, Coleman and Gerton, or Gerton maybe, 1993, posited that to be culturally competent within their own or other cultures, individuals would need to possess a strong personal identity, have knowledge and facility with the beliefs and values of the culture, display sensitivity to the effective processes of the culture, communicate clearly in the language of the given cultural group, and perform socially sanctioned behavior, maintain active social relations within the cultural group and negotiate the institutional structures of that culture. So what they're saying is just to kind of boil this, to like sidestep and boil down what is going on here. They're saying that there's a whole lot of things that go into cultural competence. And so let us, the identity Marxists, manage your children in terms of teaching them to be culturally competent. So all we're going to do in school now, because cultural competence is so important and we can't have academic success without it, then we have to focus on cultural competence much to the exclusion of other activities like math and because we wouldn't learn math allegedly anyway or it wouldn't be equitably learned anyway so we're going to get sidestep math now we're going to do cultural competence activities all the fucking time and we're going to do them in terms of cultural identity marxism as the tool to do it that's what they're actually asking for and they're citing other crap to justify the demand and sel is the brand name for this or castle actually is literally the brand name as such, cultural competence includes cultural humility, which is a Marxist idea, and implicated not only in self and social awareness, but also relationship skills and responsible decision making. Further, given the increased diversity and cross-cultural contact that increasingly characterizes the extant global community, cultural fluency or voluntary acquisition and facility with a second culture can be viewed as a desired relationship skill. Indeed, some evidence suggests that intercultural competence or bicultural culturality are associated with positive social, emotional, and academic outcomes. Okay, some evidence suggests that, that if you spend a lot of time making kids bicultural or teaching them intercultural competence, that there might be sometimes some positive social, emotional, and academic outcomes. Sometimes. Some evidence says that. So let the Marxists take it over, right? Social identities are informed by culturally defined groups. I told you, your identity is in your group in this identity Marxist shit. You aren't yourself. You are a member of your group. Social identities are informed by culturally defined groups and can be ascribed, adopted, or constructed. They can also be associated with social advantage and social disadvantage as they often define membership in in-groups and out-groups. Their treatment of race and ethnic, gender, and immigrant social identities, sorry, in their treatment, uh, Gavami, uh, there's a lot of letters, Katsiaficus, Katsiaficus, I guess that's a Greek name, and Rogers from 2016, offered that social identities include centrality and importance, evaluation and regard, knowledge of group stereotypes, and awareness of discrimination. We acknowledge the powerful roles of class and gender identity in predicting a child, youth, and adult self-definition, the nature of interpersonal interactions, and patterns and skills and interests, uh, patterns of skills and interests in the areas of education, occupation, and leisure. However, U.S. cultural norms conflate with race and class such that material wealth is associated with being white, and both are uncritically accepted as indicators of success. Well, they said that, not anybody else, didn't they? That white and rich are, are uh, associated with wealth and accepted as indicators of success. You'd think they like cited somebody proving that, right? They didn't. This fosters a sense of white racial entitlement. Well, there's a leap and unearned privilege, as well as negative racialized biases and stereotypes about people of color and those from low-income backgrounds. Do you suspect that critical race theory's presence might be felt here? Yes, it is. As a result, there is a voluminous literature on ethnic racial identity, ERI, development. Uh, they cite themselves quite a bit here. And as such, the present article focuses on ethnic racial as an exemplar of social identity, probably because they don't want to talk about queer because they're going to have to start talking about stuff that they really don't want people to see. But it's going to be there too. 
decades, they tell us, of research. Decades of research indicates that children, youth, and adults are actively and regularly grappling with the meaning of their own race and ethnicity and the role of race and ethnicity more general, uh, more generally in their lives and society. And Morgan Freeman told us a long time ago that if we stopped talking about it so much, that would actually diminish rather than using the critical race theory approach of talking about it all the damn time, which seems to make that salience, the identity salience go up, especially when you're saying that race is the center of how society is constructed and that it is the uh, the fundamental organizing principle of society and that it creates unjustly creates racial winners and racial losers uh, in an inequitable way. You might actually cause people and you tell them that their race is a anchor of subjectivity in a Marxist sense and a positive site for identity politics that's going to be demanded through the program. And they're, they're, they're complaining that decades of research indicates that children, and youth and adults are actively and regularly grappling with the me- uh, meaning of their own race and ethnicity and the role of race and ethnicity more generally in the lives and society. So in other words, they're creating the conditions that ju- that's the thing that's going to justify needing this racial SEL. And they're creating the conditions that justify the use of racial SEL. That's the snake oil process. Although early work in this area relied on stage models of racial identity, as uh, Gavami et al. suggested, more recent work is guided by multi-dimensional models that include both identity content and developmental processes. Racial ethnic identity content includes the abiding centr- the abiding centrality that's in parentheses uh, and situational importance salience of race. I just talked about salience of identity, personal that is private and public regard for one's racial group, and the idealized nature of intra intra group intra inside group race relations, namely ideology. There, hello Marxism. How are you? Good to see you, Carl. One sense of racial ethnic centrality and private, that is one's own regard for their group, are most relevant to self-awareness. That's why you have to have white fragility and people have to have, they have to have, as Judith Katz put it in 1978, white awareness. They have to have a sense of what it means to be white. And that's why the racial minorities have to be given instruction through uh, critical race theory's idea of double consciousness or kaleidoscopic consciousness or intersectional positionality so that you can be self-aware of who you actually are. But that's going to be tied directly into what they say next. Social awareness is implicated in public. That is perceptions how others regard one's racial and ethnic group. Racial and ethnic ideologies refer to the idealized nature of intra-group race relations and would be relevant to relationship skills and responsible decision-making. So in other words, it fits in the castle model. In other words, identity Marxism belongs in castle. Castle being SEL program. Such ideologies include assimilation, seeking to blend into the dominant society. Remember, dominant society is bad. So that's a form of oppression. Oppressed minority, forging a common bond with other oppressed groups. There's your solidarity across intersectionality. Nationalism, working together with same race others. Wait, what? Nationalism is working together with same race others. I keep telling people that the critical race theory thinks of the various races or the critical, all the critical identity theories think of the various identities, intersectional identities, like they are their own countries and that they have a folkish nationalism. And that's why they use the word folks all the time. Why do they say queer folks, black folks, white folks, etc.? Because they think of the racial or other forms of identities, uh, groups as, and the cultures as a folkish nation, folkish in the spelled with a V German sense that Hitler also exploited to create, uh, what was it? Ein Volk, uh, one, one people, Ein Reich, uh, one, one, uh, regime, uh, Ein Führer, one father, and then Hitler, um, folkish nationalism, you know, Hitler's not the only folkish nationalist from Germany, but W.E.B. Du Bois is the one in his souls of black folk who brought the German folkish nationalism that he had studied while a grad student in Germany. And he fell in love with to the idea of race and the critical race theorists have incorporated significantly. And here it is being called out exactly uh, explicitly nationalism being one of the senses working together with same race others told people, man, and humanism, that's a Marxist word, understanding and emphasizing the shared experiences of all humans, regardless of racial, ethnic background. So there's a good side to humanism, which is kind of that. And then it's also what Marx thought his whole program was, was humanistic because it doesn't need God. It's not theological, it's humanistic. 
human is the center. The bulk of the recent research in this area has focused on racial centrality and public and private regard. There has been less attention to salience and ideological dimensions. Although feeling good about one's racial self and being socially aware of issues of race, hello, critical race theory, seem relevant to all forms of SEL, centrality is transformative. Centrality. What does Gloria Ladson Billings tell us that critical race theory exists to do? It exists to make race the central construct for understanding inequality. It's a direct quote from Toward a Critical Race Theory of Education from 1995. Okay, centrality is transformative in the context of racialized oppression. Hello, Marxism. Assimilation and humanism seem consistent with personally responsible and participatory SEL, whereas oppressed minority and nationalism are transformative in nature. Thinking of your races as nations is transformative communist in nature. That's why there's so many weird parallels between national socialism and, say, national equityism, which equityism would be socialism, through critical race theory. The races are the nations. The identity groups intersectionally are na- thought of as nations, and whereas oppressed minority and nationalism are transformative communist in nature. It's right there in black and white when you know what you're reading. There's also been a focus on adolescence as a critical period for ERI development. This work portrays ERI as multifaceted, including the process of constructing an ERI as well as what an ERI. Let's go back up because I forgot what ERI is. You probably did too. Uh, ethnic racial identity. So adolescence is a critical period for ethnic and racial identity development. The work portrays ethnic and racial identity as multifaceted, including the process of constructing an ethnic racial identity, as well as the content that is feelings, beliefs, and attitudes associated with that identity. Sounds like they're going to use critical consciousness as a tool here. Meta-analyses and narrative reviews, narrative reviews, have helped to clarify the ways in which uh, ethnic and racial identity may promote positive adjustment outcomes among African-American, Latino, Asian-American, Pacific Islander, and American Indian youth, which I'm sure that's some seriously rigorous stuff and not at all Marxism. Identity Marxism, to be more clear. We find comparatively little research on white racial identity development, and a recent review of research on white teacher identity pointed to the need for re- for research that appreciates the complexities of white racial identity and its development. Maybe you could use Judith Judith Katz's white racial or white awareness book, uh, which says that it's a form of schizophrenia. That's what she says about white privilege in that book, or whiteness actually. Anyway. There is no positive white racial identity, according to Robin D'Angelo. So the complexities, which are never positive, of white racial identity and its development, especially in connection with the implications for classroom practice with diverse students. You're going to have to be an ally in full solidarity. It's totally an extortion racket. It's going to force you to be an identity Marxist. There's been recent, re- that's what D'Angelo's program, that's what Katz's program, that's what it's actually all about. There's been recent research conducted to understanding the ways in which the projected demographics shift to a majority minority country might impact racial attitudes among whites. So they're focusing on this canard so that they have some weird justification under like the white genocide objection or whatever, or white replacement thing. They probably want to trigger people into acting and acting out about that because it would serve their interests. Craig and Richardson, uh, 2017, found that information about increasing diversity was associated with more explicit and implicit racial bias. See, so that I don't know, this is a, this is a thing. I haven't read the paper, but I do know this, that if you hit me, or hit people, not me, me for sure, but people in general with identity Marxist bullshit about race and ethnicity and identity, that it pisses them off. And I know that these identity Marxist programs use that frustration under brand, brand names like white fragility to say that there's more bias present when in fact you might be mad at the Marxism or the fact that you're making race salient when it doesn't need to be because most people in the advanced Western world have decided that race salience or identity salience is actually not that great. It actually is the source of the problems of conflict across these divides. Um, so they, they like to conflate these things and say that, well, we did these interventions and it made things worse. 
and they never believe that it might be the way in which they did the intervention that made things worse. Like that people don't want to have to talk about race and racism all the time. And it's not because they're racist, racist. it's because the program is making people more racist, calling people names, putting them in in boxes they don't need to be put in, etc. Read White Fragility and you can see that the whole thing is a giant freaking self-fulfilling prophecy. She even says, I started to badger people about how racist they were and they reacted badly and that's proof that they're even more racist. That's the whole concept of White Fragility. The whole thing's that Kafka trap. And so here we have a study proving this stuff. They, it, it's, I haven't read the study. Maybe it's not as bad as white fragility, but I'm just saying my experience with this is I can guess that it is. This can have negative implications, they say, for social and emotional competence development in all forms of SEL, but represents a particular challenge for transformative SEL in certain segments of the white population. You might not like it. I wonder why. You hit them with the identity Marxism and it pisses them off because it sucks. For example, they tell us, there has been considerable attention to, but fairly little, systematic research on teacher implicit racial racial bias, because implicit bias is stupid and it's fake. However, anti-black, pro-white implicit racial associations appear to be fairly common in non-black samples. This actually cites the original implicit bias research that's been more or less wholly debunked at this point and are described as automatic cognitive associations people make between a given social group and certain feelings, concepts, and evaluations. People are thought to be generally unaware, unable to strategically control, and unwilling to explicitly endorse such beliefs. In other words, what they find is that in adults, even if they have implicit biases, that they don't actually, when they take the stupid implicit bias test, whatever that represents, They don't actually put those into practice in any meaningful way because the way that you react to something in the millisecond range on a computer test, which by the way is extremely gameable and fake, doesn't necessarily translate to how you're going to actually engage with human beings in reality where you might use a little like prefrontal lobe deliberation before you make a decision. It doesn't translate, but let's bring it up anyway as a justification for why we need this. Uh, and whether people are generally unaware, so they're going to need critical theory to bring it out. Those reporting such biased attitudes also report fewer black friends and feeling less comfortable interacting with blacks. Uh, how did Robin D'Angelo do on that test? Jeez. Um, th- I can't gauge these studies in their quality, but shoddy is usually the name of the game. This stuff's all just fucking made up to support their conclusions. Important to note, these scholars speculate that moderate associations between explicit and implicit racial bias may explain why racial disparities in school outcomes can continue to exist even in school contexts where well-intended corrective efforts have been tried. Lots to unpack there. I hate having to unpack all their crap all the time. So moderate associate, (laughs) speculate the moderate association between explicit and implicit racial bias, which by the way, I think has been mostly, if not completely debunked, may explain, might not but it may explain why racial disparities in school outcomes can continue to exist. And here we go. Even in school contexts where well-intended corrective efforts have been tried. In other words, they can put their stupid SEL or equity program in or diversity, equity, inclusion crap that doesn't work because it's based on identity Marxism. You don't get the outcome. Oh, it must be the hidden implicit and explicit biases and their moderate relationship. That might explain it. And because there's still differences in outcome, Ibram Kendi tells us that's proof of discrimination. They do this fucking constantly. They put their crap into place, and when it doesn't work, they say everything must be secretly very, like, hidden, still happening. This must be secret implicit biases that still cause the problem. It can't possibly be that their stupid shit program that's based in stupid shit doesn't work, and in fact makes things worse. Nope, it might be the moderate relationship between uh, implicit and explicit racial biases. It might be that it could be, it couldn't possibly, however, be that their, their snake oil is garbage. Couldn't possibly, they have no concept of any of this. Now get ready for this. What's coming next? A related concept, white fragility refers to racial stress experienced as a result of various types of challenges to the sense of privilege associated with being white. Such challenges are purported to trigger negative emotions and internalizing or externalizing defensive behaviors. D'Angelo, 2011, that's the original paper rather than her book, and thus may be quite relevant for how we understand self-management among some white children, youth, and adults in settings where issues of race are salient. They cite Robin frickin' D'Angelo, who I keep bringing up, as relevant to this. Well, there you go. At the same time, lab-based social psychology research 
Studies, uh, sorry, social psychology research studies with white participants have demonstrated that positive cues about social connectedness, shared group membership, and engaging in, uh, in the authentic cultural activities of diverse groups can decrease implicit bias and increase interest of the culture of others and concurrently over time. No, oh, sorry, concurrently and over time. So Taco Tuesday is good. No, not if you culturally appropriate. This is setting up a perpetual wheel of being able to say, you did it wrong. You did it wrong. You did it wrong. We didn't get the results that we wanted, so you must have done it wrong. It must have been your fault, racist. You need to do more of this. You have white fragility if you don't like hearing it. This body of research seems particularly important given that the majority of classroom teachers continue to be middle-class white women as the student population is becoming increasingly diverse. So let's twist the twist the ratchet on the white women the most because they are actually the target demographic because they are the most manipulable by this particular race ideology. There we go. Next up, intersectionality, which is the tool that was devised to twist white women into a knot. Great. We agree with Nago, uh, Nagaoka, I think I said that right, at all 2015, that an integrated identity is desirable there is a desirable developmental outcome among young people, an integrated identity. Understanding the nature of healthy integration requires an intersectional approach. Doubt. Okay, so an integrated identity, that's important. That's good. We agree, they say. But to really understand what that looks like, we need an intersectionality. Probably not. Intersectionality evolved out of black feminist theorizing that recognized that each person belongs to multiple social categories that occur in historical and sociopolitical contexts that may subject them to multiple oppression simultaneously. This is where you can put a bookmark, write it down, that you need to go read or listen to the podcast I did here on New Discourses about the true history of intersectionality, where you find out that the intersectionality is just a gigantic identity Marxist program. Intersectionality is, in fact, a buzzword that means identity Marxism. That's how it actually works. Uh, so it's necessary, apparently, for all of this. Um, as such, they say, we agree that there is a need to focus more on how understanding and experience of each is filtered through others within and across members of relevant groups than on which social category is more salient. So you're always going to be constantly engaging positionality in a relational sense relation to the power dynamics of society and how they intersect in a matrix of domination, probably. Ethnic, racial, gender, and class identity have been studied as separate and distinct areas of inquiry. However, some scholars have effectively argued that in, increasing multi in an increasingly multicultural context, there is a need to illuminate how membership in multiple social groups intersect and shape experiences of privilege and disadvantage within and across developmental domains, for example, peers, schooling, and employment. In other words, we need intersectionality as part of transformative SEL. They go on to actually say this explicitly. Given that transformative SEL advances equity and excellence, <laughs> doubt on that second one, we see the nexus of racial, ethnic identity, academic identity, and disciplinary identification as one of the more productive lines of inquiry. For example, research has shown that having a positive sense of one's racial identity can buffer black students against school-based discrimination and support one's ac academic success. Again, back to the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. It's assumed that white kids are always going to have this positive racial identity, so you don't have to worry about them. So it's only about black kids, and the intersectionality is apparently the way to give them a positive anchor for subjectivity, as Kimberly Crenshaw had it in Mapping the Margins, her landmark paper about intersectionality that I keep referring to. So you don't have to worry about whether or not white kids have a positive racial identity because they say, in fact, that having a positive sense of one's racial identity can have good effects. But then you read Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility and it says there is no such thing as a positive white identity. It's on page like 149 or 150 of the book. She literally explicitly says there is no such thing as a positive white identity. For example, research has shown that, ha that having a positive sense of one's racial identity can buffer let's skip black students here, can buffer against school-based discrimination and support one's academic success. There is no such thing as a white, a positive white identity. 
Do you see what's going on here? This is there, the the assumption is that if you are in the superstructural position, if you are in the privileged position, if you have access to the uh, the upper echelon, the bourgeois property of society, in other words, in this case, whiteness, that you can't possibly have any problems. So we can make sure that we change your view of your racial identity to worse, and then try to use uh, the racial conflict theory rooted in critical race theory as race Marxism to create a positive subjectivity in other racial identities. And then that might buffer black students against school-based discrimination and support one's academic success. That's what's going on. Other work has shown that many students' pervasive notions of being a good student include conformity and compliance, and that this is inconsistent with a type of sustained, creative, collaborative, scholarly participation, consumer critic, producer, required for them to approximate scientists and engineers in STEM disciplines. Alignment across these aspects and elements of identity is pivotal to transformative SEL. So intersectionality is also going to be pivotal to transformative SEL because it's identity Marxism. It is actually a syringe to inject identity Marxism into your kids. So the first ingredient in the syringe is the psychological breaking down of your kid so that they are susceptible to this cult indoctrination in whatever form it takes. And then the identity Marxist theories like queer theory, gender theory, critical race theory, etc., are the rest of the poison in the syringe, SEL being the syringe, that is going to then transform them into identity Marxists who have to take up intersectional positional thinking and along with all the rest. Agency and efficacy as aspects of self-management and relationship skills. New section. Self-regulation is featured prominently in SEL. That should be like not flipping out, not breaking down, not having a fit or whatever. Self-regulation is featured prominently in SEL because it contributes to short-term and long-term adaptive, effective, that's emotional, cognitive, social, social, emotional, metacognitive, and academic development processes, modulation of stressful experiences, conflict resolution, and resilience. As such, self-regulation, that's probably all legitimate, by the way, you can regulate yourself, you're going to do better in social environments. That's a lot of words for how that works. As such, self-regulation may undergird the ability to productively, it does say this, I'm not reading it wrong. Self-regulation may undergird the ability to productively engagement with the social and physical world. Productively engage, I'm sure is what they meant. However, cultural orientation and identity are also relevant to agency. Uh-oh, we're going to do the intersectional thing where the structural determinism says that you actually are not an individual. You are actually a member of a group that has been structurally determined and your moral character has been essentialized under the umbrella of that structural determinism, which results from the Marxist analysis of the conflict between the uh, various identity-based power dynamics. Hmm. So self-regulation is going to get put into a woke context. And have you noticed, just let me pose the question for the listener. Have you noticed how good the woke are at self-regulating? They're fucking shit at it. Okay, at least I said it. Have you noticed how good they are at it? Screaming at the sky, being weirdos, throwing a fit, absolutely out of control. That's what that's so important to teach them through SEL. That's what they want to do to your kids. Turn them into that weirdo that's going to end up on libs of TikTok getting made fun of across the internet for flipping out over something stupid. Although it is important to limit or inhibit oneself in some instance, uh uh-oh, it is equally important to be agentic, to participate in or actively change an interaction or context. Uh Uh-oh, So that's true. Sometimes you have to be able to regulate yourself. Sometimes you have to take action. You have to be, you know, you have to, you have to, you can't be a doormat. You got to step up. You got to take care of the situation. You got to change the situation. Guess what this is going to get turned into? You have to become a collectivist activist for identity Marxism, of course. They appropriately leverage the work of Bandura 2000, who defines agency as comprising A, devising an action plan, B, goal setting to anticipate, guide, and motivate action, C, self-reactiveness or re- the requisite self-regulatory knowledge and skills to follow the course of action and D self-reflectiveness such that one can examine their perf- personal efficacy as it relates to the meaning effectiveness of an adjustment to a specific course of action. That's probably correct. So that's going to get hijacked to say that we're going to teach you to be little group activists using Marxist ideology. 
We see utility in Bandura's 2002 notion of moral agency in the context of the present interest in distinguishing among how forms of SEL might help realize equitable learning environments, that's their only goal, communism, and outcomes. Paulo Ferreri's nightmare schools, that's their outcome, equitable learning environments and outcomes. He proposed that moral agency refers to a self-reactive process through which people refrain from wrongdoing toward others, that's going to get hijacked, and the proactive engagement in humane behavior, that's going to get hijacked. This seems like an important motivating factor for both advantaged and disadvantaged groups, Uh uh-oh, that's how they're going to do it, that warrants systematic attention. Agency lends itself to understanding the ways in which individuals or groups employ psychological resources to express and realize resilience. Resilience is the buzzword, one of the buzzwords of the century, by the way. Resilience is pivotal to the issues of equity, to issues of equity when SEL is advanced from a personally responsible and participatory perspective. However, there's a, so that's probably where all the normal stuff would be. However, there's a growing body of work on resistance alluded to earlier relevant to our emerging notion of transformative SEL, not resilience, resistance. Wayne Rogers, 2017, suggested that resistance is a core feature of healthy social and emotional development that begins in early childhood. It refers to a process by which individuals or groups resist stereotypes, roles, and expectations that support their oppression and understand their hu- and undermine their humanity and how such patterns change over time. In other words, it's going to be identity Marxism. Ta-da! Look how transformative SEL just shoved that right in. We had this long discussion about how important self-regulation is and taking up agency is, and now what's it going to be about? It's going to be about identity Marxism. That's how you're going to do it. Resist. Hashtag resist. (laughs) Self-regulate. Scream at the sky. Ah! There has been some more recent attention to students' social self-efficacy, as an indicator of their agency and contributing to positive relational processes in their classrooms. Social self-efficacy. Hmm. There is a body of research on teacher self-efficacy as well. Teacher self-efficacy refers to teacher beliefs that they can influence how well students learn, even those students who may be difficult or unmotivated. So they believe that they can achieve their goal as a teacher even with difficult students. Such beliefs by teachers have been linked to their instructional quality, job satisfaction, and emotions, and a range of desirable student academic, psychological, and social outcomes. So teachers that are believe that they can actually successfully teach tend to teach better. Okay, great. So what are they going to do? Can we predict it or can we guess? Are they going, I know I've read the paper before, but I don't really remember. Are they going to tell us that when you do the transformative version that you are better at that? Of course they are. That identity Marxism is the key. Given our contention, which, by the way, if identity Marxism is all through SEL, critical race theory is all through SEL, so is queer theory, so is gender theory, so is fat studies, so is disability studies, so are all of them. Given our contention that SEL is a civic enterprise, we include literature on political agency and efficacy, which refers to an individual's belief in his or her own knowledge and skills to act socially and politically. Uh Uh-oh, here comes the political activism part, like I was saying. The fundamental assumption of this component of sociopolitical development, we're going to remember that SPD, is that people take action when they believe that the use of their voice and action can make a difference. This is going to get real activisty real fast. And that's probably a good study that's being hijacked, but I don't know for sure. Such political efficacy is consistent with empowerment or sociopolitical control, which refers to self-efficacy related specifically to community and political action. This individual, that's where some hijacking has just occurred. This individual agency is the personal belief that one has the capacity to understand and affect community change through their own purposeful actions. Similarly, sociopolitical control is the perceived capacity to change social conditions and participate in individual and collective social action to affect social change. We are deep into Marxist territory at this point. And this is where transformative SEL, if you want to have agency, you have to become an activist on their terms. Some empirical work has been found to support this theoretical assumption. For for instance, self-efficacy to promote justice was found to moderate the relationship between just world beliefs and pro-social behavior. In addition, Watson Guesses, G-U-E-S-S-O-U-S, 
2006, found that experiences of agency in previous community or political projects moderated the relationships between just world beliefs and commitment to future civic activities, but did not predict recent past civic behaviors. On the other hand, Hope and Yeagers found that political efficacy moderated the relationship between civic education and civic participation behaviors. Okay, so there's some statements of things that may or may not be actually true because they cited some stuff and nobody believes the academic literature for good reasons anymore, but let's see what they say about all that stuff. Further, collective ac- collective efficacy is an essential transformative SEL competence. Oh, collective efficacy. Although, because we're talking about personal agency, right? Agency is located in collective efficacy in transformative SEL. So your individual has to be socialized to become social man, to work collectively for their group identity, and to identify as a member of that group, but as an activist member of that group that is effective at doing identity politics on behalf of that group uh, to have collective efficacy. And that's an essential transformative SEL competence that they want to teach your children. Although there has been some attention to the notion of collective classroom efficacy among students, what the hell does that mean? Everybody gets the same grade. They're not really, but maybe. There has also been considerable attention to collective teacher efficacy. Collective teacher efficacy reflects the capacity of a school faculty to promote student learning. So everybody, all for one, one for all. This group level belief contributes to emotional experiences and teacher job satisfaction and to some academic outcomes. This is going to all justify collaborative work that's going to screw over the top kids to the benefit of the worst kids. That's what it's all going to boil down to. But it's also going to have to happen with peer groups within teachers. It is also noteworthy that collective efficacy has been applied in the civic domain. It connotes neighborhood residents' perceived collective capacity to take coordinated and interdependent action on issues that affect their lives. Mm. There's two things here. There's collectivism and there's teamwork. Can the neighborhood team up and do, you know, a team effort to make changes? Sure. What about collective? Well, that's a different framing, isn't it? And collective activity requires solidarity and it also requires subordination of the self to the group. And remember the perversion here, the inversion, in fact, or perversion, both are right, completely right, is that this is being put under the guise of how transformative SEL creates this sense of agency collectively. So where do we leave off? perceived collective capacity to take coordinated and independent action on issues that affect their lives and has been associated with reductions in violent crime, homicide, and obesity rates. Depends on the perspective on that. Collectivism doesn't usually work, but teamwork usually does. It may be a useful construct for understanding school, family, community partnerships to advance educational initiatives, maybe, such as a systemic Uh, Sorry, system. No, it is systemic transformative SEL. So our thing might work. So here, let's do it. Such collective efficacy can be built on individual civic engagement by creating and leveraging social bonding capital. So here's a bunch of stuff that sounds really smart and evidenced and everything. So our thing might work to do that. Let's do it. Nice argument. Belonging and engagement are relevant to social awareness and responsible decision making. That's the next section. Sense of belonging or connectedness. This is so going to be so collectivist, represent a fundamental need for relatedness with others and is thus foundational to healthy human functioning across developmental periods and contexts. So here we're going to have the hijacking of something true. School belonging. Remember, that's a double pronged word for Marxists. It's a woke word. It contains a woke agenda is viewed as one of the more important factors associated with students, social and emotional well-being, academic self-efficacy and motivation and school satisfaction. Also, I'm sorry, and academic achievement. It implies a student's felt experience of acceptance, respect, and inclusion by adults and peers, and includes con- constructs such as school identity, school connectedness, and emotional engagement. As such, extant school belonging research sta- seems most relevant to participatory SEL. Okay, that's not good enough. Belonging, by the way, in woke actually means that you are affirming that person so that they constantly feel like they belong. So where Inclusion would mean that we're never going to say anything that might offend a person of a particular group, which might make them feel not included or excluded. So we're going to censor ourselves and remove people who they don't want to have around. Belonging means we have to positively affirm whatever they say as being valuable and it makes them feel like they belong in that thing. So 
that moment in what is it happy gilmore where he gives that answer and the guy gives the iconic reply that everybody in the room is stupider for having hurt that would be an example of the opposite of belonging they would have to say happy gilmore you're just the greatest it's so great that you participated in all this da 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 that would be belonging it doesn't matter how wrong you are that's going to be uh, that's important to understand what belonging means. School belonging is thought to be particularly important in supporting developmental outcomes among students from historically marginalized groups and communities. Uh-oh, we're going to have to make sure they feel like they belong by proactive steps. That's what I was just explaining. It is noteworthy that there's a strong relationship between sense of school belonging and social awareness. Research also points out also points to increased racial awareness and a decline in public regard, a component of ethnic and racial identity among students of color as they grow older. This suggests that students may be increasingly aware of negative views that adults and peers hold of their ethnic and racial group. It may be. Maybe. So we'll just go with it. This realization has prompted some scholars to include racial school climate and microaggressions in their work on school practices and climate. It might be true, so let's just incorporate this stuff. And when it makes it worse, that was because um, there was resistance or whatever other be, you know system that's still in place, whatever other bullshit explanation that they have for why their thing never actually works. Consistent with transformative SEL, Powell in 2012 offered that belonging in a democratic society means that, quote, members are more than just individuals. They also have a collective power and share a linked fate. So belonging means collectivism. Belonging implies not only recognition, but also full involvement in meaning making and the building of relationships and institutions. So you have to be made to feel like you belong by everybody else. It's everybody else's responsibility. It connotes co-constructing or producing the nature, terms, and goals of interactions and institutions. In this sense, students, uh, sorry, student authentic, it's another grammatical mistake. I almost fixed it automatically. In this sense, student authentically partner in and or lead the school process. Well, that's a big jump. Student authentically partner in and or lead the school process so they can feel like they belong. So teachers and principals and resource officers and everything else, you're, the students are they're partnering in and leading the schooling process now over you. That's very Paulo Freire, that teachers and students have to be dialectically synthesized so there's no power dynamic between them, so that there are teacher students and student teachers, and that it's often student-led learning. That's a great idea because kids are usually great at pick, picking their own curriculum. This transformative type of belonging exceeds access and inclusion reflected in personally responsible and participatory SEL. So it's not really about access. That's that's the personally responsible stuff. And it's not even about inclusion, which is that nobody's going to be offended, which is participatory. And is contrasted with exclusion and marginalization of failed citizenship. So this is something that's going to require proactively making the kids feel like they belong and that they have a leadership role in how the schooling goes to make them feel that way. Evidence suggests that why? Because if people feel like they belong, they do better. This is a complete like farce around what these words mean. That they they've manipulated a terrible policy around. Oh well, if kids feel like the this might make kids feel like they belong more, and when they feel like they belong more, they might do better. As if that's the only variable contributing to what makes people do better. Evidence suggests that a sense of belonging can play a pivotal role in student school engagement. That's a whole paragraph all by itself. That's kind of funny. This is, again, an education paper, just to point that out. As such, school improvement initiatives such as SEL view school engagement as a meaningful gauge of the success of their efforts to positively influence students' academic and socio-emotional well-being. Like Allensworth et al., 2018, we believe that school engagement is an important prerequisite and result of learning. School engagement reflects students' thoughts, feelings, and behaviors with regard to the relationship to school, including attitudes toward the classroom environment and specific learning activities. Fredericks et al., 2004, posited that school engagement were more facts that we're going to hijack, by the way. That school engagement comprises interrelated cognitive, emotional, and behavioral components. Cognitive engagement is the use of self-regulatory and metacognitive strategies to plan, monitor, and reflect on one's thinking. Emotional engagement refers to students' sense of belonging and connectedness to school. Finally, behavioral engagement is represented by positive school conduct and active involvement in academic tasks and extracurricular activities. Just as an aside because we're going to get to see it again, I get a bet in a minute. You're getting a great education as we go through this paper of how 
Words mean one thing when normal people use them, and then when the woke get a hold of them, they put some kind of weird spin and agenda into them over and over and over again. This is what they do. They misuse language, in fact, purposefully misuse language to forward their agendas. Oh, belonging, blah, 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 all this great. Here's some evidence. Duh, duh, duh. Here's this other thing that we think means belonging, and that's what we're going to do now because belonging is good, and you wouldn't want to be against belonging, which has all this evidence behind it. They're just misusing the word with a purpose, of course. Civic engagement has emerged as a focal aspect of human development in the last 15 years past 15 years. Let me get the words right. Civic engagement encompasses a range of knowledge, values, attitudes, and behaviors related to involvement in one's local community, including school and broader society. So we're going to have to be civically engaged. (laughs) Guess where this is going. Much of the recent work has focused on personally responsible, that is, by being helpful, or sorry, for example, by being helpful in their local community in a general sense, in participatory citizenship, engaged in civic life through particular social, or sorry, particular local clubs, traditional clubs, and civic organizations, social institutions, and political activities. Less attention has been given to the Marxist thing. Less attention has been given to early manifestations of transformative justice-oriented citizenship, including active engagement in institutional and system change efforts. Marxism. Yeah, up until you guys took over, nobody did Marxist shit in our society. What a discovery. And that's, of course, they're complaining about it because that's really important and we haven't done it yet. Elsewhere, we have pointed to kindred notions of empowerment, critical consciousness, and SPD, which I already forgot what SPD means. I said we were going to forget what SPD means. Maybe you remember, but I sure don't. And I don't even remember where it was defined. Sociopolitical development or something like that. Uh, sociopolitical was the SP part. And I don't see where it is. So we're going to have to just go with SPD from now on. And you can rewind it and find it yourself. Um, so kindred notions of empowerment, critical consciousness, and SPD. So we're going to bring Marxist consciousness into whatever the sociopolitical awareness is so we can have civic engagement. That's where we're at. And so those are a lens through which to explore and promote transformative and justice-oriented competencies. For example, the SPD model considers the individual and contextual factors through which youth understand to become involved in personal and or collective behaviors for societal change, activism. In this sense, it links interpersonal, meaning self-awareness and self-management, and interpersonal, including social awareness, to institutional, by the way, the comma is inside the parentheses there, they're doing great here in the education paper, to institutional, which includes relationship skills and responsible decision-making pillars of SEL, competencies. Critical self and social analyses are pivotal aspects of SPD, critical self and social analyses. So if we want to do proper sociopolitical development or whatever the D stands for, we want to create civically engaged sociopolitical agents out of our students, we have to use critical and self and social analysis. Critical theory is how you're going to get there. Uh, So critical and self, uh, critical self and social analyses are pivotal aspects of SPD and connote to an evolving understanding of cultural, economic, and political systems. How these systems Marxism, 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 shape society and how societal definitions impact one's own status within the society to guide individual and collective sense of efficacy, as described earlier, and actions to ameliorate oppression and injustice and realize liberation. That's why it's going to go to liberatory education in the long run, but we remember that liberation means liberation from the all oppressions of society and maybe the limits of subjectivity created by all social relations and thus from reality itself. In other words, it means communism. Thus, individual and groups engage in co-creating the spaces where they belong and can thrive. It's a collective effort, gang. Social man is only social man when he lives in social society where everybody is social man and realizes that we are social entities co-creating the spaces where we belong and can thrive. Communism. We offer this initial graduate profile of transformative social and emotional competence with the understanding that specifying the developmental trajectories and pathways for these competencies is a necessary next step in our work. In this connection, we now turn to what would appear to be promising programs, approaches, and practices for promoting transformative competence development. The answer is going to be collectivist activity. 
So I already talked about table two. I'm not going to go back up. Table two describes our initial effort. So this is some promising programs and approaches for advancing transformative competence development. Table two describes our initial effort to organize programs and approaches based on personally responsible, participatory, and most important, transformative forms of SEL. As Table 2 shows, we contend that culturally infused SEL, skill development, project-based learning, that's PBL, and youth participatory action research, YPAR, has features, youth participatory action research, brown shirts, action research, okay, brown shirts. So it's going to be putting kids in activist situations, right? Project-based learning, probably also going to be activism. Has features that are consistent with promotion of transformative social and emotional competencies we just outlined, which means making your kid a Marxist. Prominent SEL programs do not explicitly address the various competencies and considerations just mentioned. The bulk of the evidence and momentum for the development of the field has been derived from rigorous studies, yeah right, of classroom-based programs that are primarily skill development and fewer community building that employ experimental designs to aid in making casual or sorry causal claims about the program influences and impacts. Although meta-analyses meta-analyses by Durlach et al. 2011, Taylor et al. 2017, and Grant et al. 2017 do not distinguish between personally responsible and participatory forms of SEL. They have helped to further synthetic, uh, so to help to further synthesize and distill out key findings from a range of relatively well-designed investigations. Evidence indicates that SEL programs, remember there are three types, right? And then guess how that works. The transformative one is the best one, so it's the one that's going to get forwarded no matter what. Hijacked. Evidence indicates that SEL programs reduce risky behaviors and improve desired personally responsible and participatory social and emotional attitudes and behaviors. So the personal responsibility path works, and now we're going to talk about why you need the transformative Marxist path because of that. That's not instead. Because the one works, we're going to do the Marxist one because it's better. Hijacking always hijacking. That's all they do. Hijack. It's a freaking like parasite vampire thing or a virus. It's their own metaphor. It infects things and turns it into the Marxism. Get all worked up about that. Uh, second key finding is that extant SEL programs, those are going to be ones that are based on personal responsibility and civic engagement uh, or participatory, Extant SEL programs impact positively on academic outcomes as represented by improved grades and scores on standardized tests. Like I'm telling you, they have a mountain of evidence that backs up that when you do this in the responsible way that works, it's great. Then they leverage that evidence to push their Marxist horseshit on your kids, which is really Maoism. It's breaking them down psychologically to induce them into a Marxist cult. That's the injection hypodermic needle metaphor I gave. In terms of academic outcomes, it is less clear the degree to which such programs incorporate or leverage more constructivist sorry or yeah, more constructivist approaches to learning advanced in the learning sciences and linked to 21st century learning objectives. So constructivist that's postmodern and Marxist. There's gen there's not so much evidence about those because nobody in their right mind would do them until these idiots took over. There is general agreement that today's educational processes should support the development of 21st century skills that include self-directed and collaborative activities that feature critical thinking and problem solving, the ability to locate, analyze, synthesize, and apply knowledge to novel situations. Yes, but how are you going to do it, Marxists? Because social, emotional, and academic learning are intertwined, it makes sense, that, kind of, but well, they just take it. Uh, it makes sense that these higher order skills and abilities are built on and cultivated through the types of transformative social and emotional competencies just outlined, so Marxism, and enact structured learning contexts that lend themselves to collaborative inquiry, uh-oh, investigation, and problem solving applied to real world issues. Thus, we outline desired influences and impacts of transformative SEL, or as we outline these, we need to frame excellence in academic, social, and emotional learning with this in mind. This is particularly important given the ways in which adult SEL can factor into the pervasive educational opportunity gaps that we have pointed to earlier in this article. In other words, based on your identity. 
Indeed, reviews of the science of learning and development research synthesis and brain science, I don't trust these people one bit, have suggested the following educational implications for schools to be attuned to diverse students in ways that support optimal learning outcomes. One, SEL that includes explicit instruction of social and emotional competencies, as well as the infusion of learning and the use of such competencies throughout all aspects of schooling, enter, of the schooling, enter, no, just as of schooling enterprise, include educated educative and restorative discipline approach. I actually did butcher some of that. Some of it's a grammatical error that threw me off. So let me say that again, as well as the infusion learning and use of such competencies throughout all aspects of schooling enterprise, <laughs> including educated, educative and restorative discipline approaches to a caring, supportive learning environment that includes relational trust and respect among students and adults, school personnel, caregivers, and community members, a sense of being known, valued, and safe, developmentally appropriate tasks, and culturally responsive learning opportunities. Working some of this stuff in, what they're saying is it creates optimal learning outcomes, is using SEL basically on everybody, and then doing so in a way that creates relational trust and respect among students and adults, which is one of those things that might mean more than one thing. Three, productive instructional strategies that include collaborative inquiry-based activities, group learning, in other words, group projects that build on students' prior knowledges and experiences and employs explicit instruction, scaffolding, scaffolding, and application to make the work meaningful and to facilitate conceptual understanding, elaboration, co-construction, and transferable knowledge and skills, and for individualized supports that include multi, uh, multi-tiered systems of support, extended learning opportunities, and access to integrated services. So that's supposed to be when SEL makes learning better. These derivations all align well with Castle's 10 indicators of high quality school wide SEL. A, explicit SEL instruction. So we're, apparently we're going to do explicitly SEL throughout all of the school. B, SEL integrated with instruction. So now your other instruction, math, science, is going to have SEL worked into it. C, supportive classroom and school climate. So don't anybody criticize that. D, youth voice and engagement. So we're going to elevate the kids and listen to them and bring them in as kind of. Uh, leaders, breaking down that, that boundary between teacher and student. E, focus on adult SEL and relationships. F, supportive discipline. I'm sure that works out great. G, a continuum of integrated supports. Don't know what that actually means. H, systems for continuous improvement and evaluation. I, family partnerships. And J, community partnerships. C, castle.org. For the present purposes, we focus primarily on classroom-based social, emotional, and academic content, learning content, pedagogy, and teacher-student relations. Because academic, social, and emotional competencies are deeply intertwined, we should strive toward their integration and instruction. Relatedly, teaching and learning is fundamentally a relational process. It benefits from positive developmental relationships characterized by warmth, consistency, attunement, reciprocity, and joint activity, including sharing and the transfer of power and scaffolding of learning. This is from the Center on the Developing Child, 2016. The latter point about power sharing and scaffolding impresses us as an as essential to transformative SEL. For example, power sharing can foster racial and academic identity development, agency, and a sense of democratic belonging. Power sharing is going to be this kind of neo-communism thing. Power sharing. You're going to redistribute privilege because that's what moves power. Scaffolding, which is an academic term I don't fully understand yet, to be fully clear with you, can further enhance academic identity and engagement by connecting prior knowledge with new academic content. That seems like what I would guess it means, and that seems probably okay. And skills by applying them to identification and solving concerns that arise within and beyond the lived experiences of students. And now you can see it got hijacked into some direction it shouldn't go. We're going to scaffold off of lived experience instead of prior academic activity. You're not going to use what you learn in chapter one of the algebra book to move the scaffold into chapter two, or what you learn in algebra to scaffold into geometry. You're not going to do that. We're going to use students' lived experiences to scaffold fucking identity Marxism into the middle of everything, whether it's math, whether it's science, whether it's reading, whatever. I bet you that's what that means. Just saying. 
This aligns with Mira and Morell's 2011 notion of teachers as civic agents in a critical democracy. In other words, teachers are the ones who are supposed to be indoctrinating the kids or programming them really as Marxists for a critical democracy. And they're civil or yeah, civic agents. They are the ones that are making that happen to make a critical democracy, which is communism. Further, this is consistent with our contention that SEL is best understood as civic develop as again. Yeah, no, sorry, uh, I keep reading it and thinking, surely to God, I messed up. But no, they messed up. This is consistent with our contention that SEL is best understood as civic development enterprise, and that schools and classrooms are mini polities, little political entities. From the perspective of transformative competence promotion, it is useful to consider schooling and adult-student relations with an empowerment framework, which I'm sure is Marxist. As an empowering organization, Wong, Zimmerman, and Parker, 2010, provided a useful typology of five patterns of youth-adult uh, relations that can be applied to student-teacher relationships. In their scheme, a vessel relationship refers to an adult control to adult control with youth having no voice and choice. Symbolic relationships are those in which adults have control, but youth have voice. Youth have voice, and youth have voice are active participants and share control in pluralistic relationships. Independent relationships refer to situations in which youth have voice and actively participate, and adults relinquish their control. Youth have voice and full control in autonomous relationships. That's a, in, oh, in autonomous relationships is the last type. Sorry, youth have voice and full control in autonomous relationships. Transformative SEL requires a pluralistic relationship that might foster youth autonomy to lead social change. Mm -hmm. So they are literally saying that transformative SEL requires an orientation to where the children, the youth, uh, have voice, are active participants, and share control. That's pluralistic relationships that might foster uh, youth autonomy, which is where they have voice and full control in order to lead social change. In other words, become activists. Culturally relevant education, which we're now going to bring in. Notions of culturally responsive, gay 2000, culturally relevant, Ladson Billings, uh, 2014, although we read 1995 for the previous podcast, and Culturally Sustaining, Alam in Paris, 2017. I've read some of that. That's freaking insane. I was like, I can't even finish this. It's so nuts. T so culturally responsive, culturally relevant, culturally sustaining teaching can be readily found in the literature. There is a general consensus that culturally informed content and instructional processes reflect the best of science of of the science of learning and development as they can afford cultural well-being, identity, and safe learning environments that can result in optimal opportunities for academic, social, and emotional learning. This is woke lies. They're, they all of citations are woke. So this is woke lies. What they're doing is they are claiming that by focusing on culture within education that you can get better outcomes in terms of cultural well-being, identity, and safe learning environments. And then this, of course, you don't have any time to actually teach subjects because you're teaching culture through math. You're teaching every culture through everything. And so all you have are little cultural critical agents of change that you're producing out of the schools who can't necessarily read, they can't do math, that don't have any scientific literacy, et cetera. But by God, they know how to be uh, little culture warriors. Uh, Aronson and Laughter, I assume it's pronounced, it might be Lauder, uh, but it's spelled like Laughter, 2016, offered the concepts of CRE, culturally responsive education, to begin to unify this literature. Culturally responsive education incorporates both content and pedagogical approaches by including the following. A, connecting a student's cultural assets and references to academic concepts and skills. B, employing curricula that encourages student reflection on their own lives and society, sounding Marxist. C, supporting student cultural competence by facilitating learning about their own and other cultures. And D, pursuing social justice through critiques of discourses of power. So you're like, maybe, okay, maybe, sounds a little Marxist, maybe. D, pursuing social justice through critiques of discourses of power. Guess what? They've said it again. CRE, culturally responsive or culturally relevant education, doesn't matter which one, includes pursuing social justice through critiques of discourses of power. They've said it explicitly. It includes identity Marxism. In fact, that's its point. Issues of culture and racial identity are conflated in some of this work. 
CRE is widely touted as an approach for sustaining and encouraging growth and the ethnic and racial identity youth bring to school as it focuses on creating learning communities in which culturally different individuals and uh, heritages are valued. Cultural knowledge of ethnically diverse cultures, families, and communities is used to guide curriculum development, classroom climates, instructional strategies, and relationships with students. Make sure all the cultural diversity in the classroom always feels completely like it belongs under the Marxist definition of belong, right? Identity Marxist definition of belonging. Spend all your time doing cultural instruction, and then you'll have a better learning environment, and you'll never actually get around to teaching them math or reading. Does that reflect what you see in your children's schools? Yes, of course it does. And how are you going to make sure to do that? You're not just going to teach them about culture. You're also going to teach them about pursuing social justice through critiques of discourses of power between these cultural identity groups. In other words, identity Marxism, woke Marxism, CRE is woke Marxism, SEL delivers woke Marxism. Culturally responsive teaching also challenges racial and cultural stereotypes, prejudices, racism, and other forms of intolerance, injustice, and oppression that very few people actually engage in in any significant way. It can easily be uh, slapped down and corrected in other ways. It encourages being change agents for social justice activists, communist activists, as a matter of fact, for social justice, which is communism, and academic equity. So socialism in the academic realm, like we all share grades. It mediates power imbalances in classrooms based on race, culture, ethnicity, and class, more communism, more collectivism, and assumes cultural responsiveness is endemic to educational effectiveness in all areas of learning for students from all ethnic groups. It assumes that cultural responsiveness is endemic to educational effectiveness. It doesn't prove it, it assumes it. The cultural backgrounds of students are used as a vehicle for learning. Ladson Billings, 1995. Remember, that's the one we read in the last podcast. That's the paper that relies on the experiences of eight cherry-picked teachers to give this whole program. Eight. Eight. In Northern California. There is some evidence, they tell us some, suggesting that culturally grounded SEL programs can be impactful with regard to risk reduction. However, such programs primarily use cultural assets to improve both participant engagement and uptake and participant outcomes. There's a lot of parentheses I'm trying to work past. But they seldom examine cultural assets such as communal values or ethnic <clears throat> or ethnic and racial identity, such as self and social awareness, as intervening or outcome variables. In other words, they're not sufficiently race conscious or ethnic conscious or identity conscious. This would be essential to move skill-focused programs toward more participatory and transformative forms of SEL. So not skills, transformative Marxism. Existing literature indicates that explicit instruction around issues of identity can have positive impacts on student outcomes. For example, Britton Lloyd and Williams, 2017, reviewed literature on programmatic efforts to promote the ethnic and racial identities of African-American youth. Conceptually, they posited that a culture-specific program philosophy is helpful because it informs, conceptually they posited that culture-specific, conceptually, is helpful because it informs the selection of materials and interpersonal interactions that reflect positive racial socialization messages and behaviors. One out of the two school-based programs they reviewed is NTU, an, Afro, an Afrocentric program designed to reduce risk behaviors, for example, by reducing tolerance of substance use and increased protective factors, including racial identity among African-American early adolescents who are considered at high risk for substance use, for example, children, so children of substance users. Among the multiple components of the intervention was a rites of passage program based on, uh, I don't even know how to say his name, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, Zvo Saba, Seven Principles of Kwanzaa, and uh, Hashima Respect. So, sorry, I don't know how to say It's not even a hymn. It's the Seven Principles. So, a rites of passage program based on the Seven Principles of Kwanzaa and Hashima Respect, which was designed to enhance adolescents' cultural awareness, development of healthy attitudes, resiliency, and social skills. Okay, let me pause for a few breaking it down points in this paragraph so far. Okay, and it's going to get worse for, for one of these two points. So one, we're going to talk about Kwanzaa. I'll come back to that. First, conceptually, blah, blah, blah. They are designing curriculum on your for your kids based on 
Marxist conceptual frameworks. They have no evidence behind them whatsoever, and they're implementing them in nationally in virtually all the schools across all grade levels. They have no evidence to support this stuff or extremely tenuous evidence or, or, or again, no evidence. I just repeat that. No evidence to support this or very little evidence to support that anybody should be doing this. And then they're going to implement this across the board. And the reason isn't because they actually think it works. It works to enable them to push the Marxist crap. Now, I'll continue this paragraph. We'll come back to Kwanzaa. Just to reiterate that point, in a quasi-experimental study, the researchers found that fifth graders in the intervention group, as compared to the comparison group, more strongly endorsed Afrocentric communal values and reported feeling more positively about being black and believing that being black is a positive attribute. That's the justification for using this approach. That's it. In a quasi-experimental study, they were able to get people to have a slightly better self-positive attitude in their racial identity rather than as, say, individuals or as Americans or whatever. And how they do it? Through fucking Kwanzaa which is a communist plot. It's fake. It was made up in the 1960s or 50s, maybe 60s. It was like literally freaking Kamala Harris is the only person in the history of the world who ever celebrated it. It is a made up program that was made up by Marxists. You can look it up. It was made up by Marxists as a Afrocentric or Afrocentric holiday that never existed before that was used to, it has some, I mean, I'm not going to necessarily crap on the values that it has, but they're very communal oriented, but it was actually introduced as a racial competitor for an ethnic competitor to Christmas so that you could Alf Haben dare Christmas. That's what it's actually about. And so it's just a fake made up project made up by uh, black communists to forward this Afrocentrism view that Africa is, you know, centering Africa as a cultural center rather than Europe as a cultural center or America as a cultural center for within this. And then it's used, it pushes communal values, which is its own thing. And then most importantly, it was made up by Marxists to compete with Christmas to create a racial dialectic around Christmas. Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, right? Uh, no, no. Hanukkah is a real holiday. Christmas is a real holiday. Kwanzaa is a fake holiday made up by Marxists who wanted to use race to agitate around Christmas and maybe Hanukkah. And that's how they do this. Okay. Our scan revealed revealed fewer studies of school-based, our scan, I'm sure they did a deep, thorough review of the literature, revealed fewer studies of school-based promotion of ethnic and racial identity among youth of other racial ethnic groups. Uh, One such program takes a universal rather than group-specific approach. Omanya Taylor, Douglas uh, Updegraff, and Marsiglia, 2018, reported on a randomized control efficacy trial of the Identity Project, a classroom-based intervention designed to promote ethnic and racial identity exploration of diverse adolescents. Diverse. Although youth of color reported higher exploration and sense of clarity about their ethnicity and race over time, The authors report expected program effects on identity exploration for all youth. These studies offer evidence that school-based programs can help foster ethnic and racial identity among diverse youth. Doesn't say why we should have that. Um, And a follow-up study suggests that increasing ethnic and racial identity exploration was related to other desired outcomes. So they do tell you why, including self-reported grades and self-esteem but not related to attitudes about interacting with members of other ethnic and racial groups. Really, ethnocentrism, uh, in that sense, or really race-o-ethnocentrism, doesn't necessarily uh, relate positively to attitudes about interacting with members of other racial groups, but it does make people have slightly higher self-esteem in their own identity. It's a poisonous way to approach things. And of course, their identity Marxists want to do that because that's the basis of their conflict theory. They have to awaken that racial consciousness. The use of CRE in, edu- in history and social studies is culturally responsive education. And social studies has been connected to heightened awareness of power of political movements and effects of racism. For example, Hughes, Bigler, and Levy in 2007 reported on a small-scale experimental study designed to examine the impacts of a week-long history unit on racism on the racial attitudes and cognitive and effective responses of black and white elementary school students. Students were exposed to biographies of famous Americans. The racism lessons included information about discriminatory experiences endured by famous blacks, whereas the control condition offered no such information. Among white children, those in the 
the racism condition reported more positive racial attitudes, greater valuing of racial fairness, and greater racial defensiveness and racial guilt than peers in the control group. Greater racial defensiveness and racial guilt. That sounds great. But that's what they want to leverage. The, the effect on racial guilt was driven by the elevated levels of older versus younger children in the racism condition. Yeah, I'm sure it was because their thing can never be can never do wrong. Let me just pause before we carry on here because a small scale experimental study made me laugh. Do you know how many small scale experimental studies there are of like supplements that are supposed to make your libido go up or your dick bigger or something? And of course they don't. Well, yeah, small scale experimental studies. There you go. And this one even comes back with, well, it in induces racial guilt, <laughs> racial defensiveness, but that's probably for some other reason, like ages. That's probably what it is. <sighs> Facing history and ourselves, that's the name of a program, it's a proper noun, which appears in the Castle Program Guide as an evidence-based program, is designed to integrate issues of race and ethnicity into regular secondary school social studies and language arts instruction. See, so now your social studies programming at your kid's school and your language arts programming is going to include issues of race and ethnicity into the regular instruction through what? Castle, S-E-L. It's going to turn your history and language arts lessons into race lessons. That's what it's for. It leverages historical examples of conflict, injustice, and discrimination to teach tolerance, social skills, and civic responsibility. The program also targets teaching practices and classroom climate. There's some evidence that the facing history in ourselves improves there's some evidence improves students' psychosocial competence and reduces racist attitudes and fighting among white youth and improved teacher sense of efficacy with the use of democratic, that is inclusive, teaching practices. There's some evidence. <laughs> there's some. Better to put it nationally in all of our schools, like our kids are freaking guinea pigs. Our interest in informed and engaged citizens makes it essential to understand whether and in what way CRE, culturally responsive education, might contribute to academic outcomes. Uh, Arsenson and Laughter's 2006, I think I said that guy's name wrong before, review suggests that CRE is associated with indicators of academic motivation, such as increased academic motivation, increased content interest, and increased confidence in and facility with content discourse and test taking. For example, Dimmick 2012 reported on the efforts of a high school environmental science teacher, one, to make students aware of how the pollution of a local river was linked to larger regional and societal problems. Sounds like activism. After a field trip to the river, students were supported in developing their own action plans for addressing the condition of the local waterway. Sounds like a kind of a cool project. This included producing an inf informative rap song to raise community consciousness and then organizing a cleanup effort. Hmm. Included producing an informative rap song to raise consciousness, and then organizing a cleanup effort. Dimmick found increased science engagement even among students who were previously disengaged during the science class. I get it, it's fun. Findings from CRE studies are also relevant to disciplinary outcomes in math and science, such as time on task, engagement, and efficacy. Classroom work and test scores among Latino and middle school students and pre-post increase in math and science thinking skills. Somehow, culturally responsive education is doing that. It'd be interesting to read the studies and see, but I'm skeptical that the effect sizes are very big. In English language arts, research indicates that culturally responsive education is associated with greater motivation and creativity, higher attendance, test scores, and college going, so they can get further indoctrinated, and improved test scores. But let's give credit where it's due. If it's working, it's, we should acknowledge that in addition to all the problems it creates. I don't think it's working, though, because our scores are actually ass across the board and all of these things, as they've done more and more of this. Gay, 2010. So the question is, you know, how are they improved? Are they improved in these small studies with small numbers of people in certain circumstances and then it gets inappropriately extrapolated out to everybody? Is there a cost-benefit analysis between that it works for some small group of people, but it hurts the large group of people? That those things are not discussed, and maybe it's in those papers, but I don't know. Gay, that's Geneva Gay, 2010, she's the culturally uh, responsive teaching person, asserted that essential actions for culturally responsive educators are replacing deficit with more affirming views of students and communities. 
The deficit model is that certain students who are underperforming are lacking in certain ways, so they have a deficit, and instead we're going to not try to correct the deficit. We're going to be affirming instead uh, of their communities and where they come from, culturally affirming mostly. Understanding why and how culture and difference are essential considerations. Willingness to conduct a critical analysis of textbooks, uh uh-oh, and other materials. Making So you're going to be a critical theorist with regard to your textbooks as you're trying to learn from them, making pedagogical connections within the teaching context and anticipating that there will be critics of culturally responsive teaching. Anticipating that there will be critics, which means sheltering yourself from the fact that people are going to criticize you for doing this irresponsible practice. It's what they always do. Oh, there will be a backlash. If we push a bunch of critical race theory, the white backlash will eventually come. Therefore, we predicted it. And it's actually something critical race theory talks about. No, this is a trick so that they can't ever get criticized. You see it throughout all their literature. White fragility is a key example. White fragility is an absolutely key example. If you push back, if you disagree, you have something wrong with you. White fragility. So there's anticipating that there will be critics and how to respond to them. Duncan uh, Adrande, 2007, offered five pillars of effective culturally relevant practice, being critically conscious of their students' potential as change agents, is the first one they list, critically conscious of their students' potential as change agents, communist activists, their sense of responsibility to the community, collectivism, preparation for high-level classroom practice, don't know what that means for sure. Socratic sensibility that supported reflection on their practice. No Hegelian sensibility that rep- supported reflection on their practice, sir. And commitment to, because Socratic is a word that means dialectical, and the Marxists don't use Socratic dialectic, they use Hegelian dialectic, don't they? And commitment to building trust with students. Yeah, we're all activists together against the evil society that we're going to overthrow together. There's trust. Some suggest that book clubs, curriculum labs, and professional learning communities provide means to develop and enact greater cultural and ethnic racial literacy, as defined by critical theorists. Well, there you go. Warren, 2018, suggested that the cultivation of empathy and perspective-taking in pre-service and in-service educators is foundational to them adopting culturally relevant pedagogical orientation and adapting and refining associated instructional practices. Remember, culturally relevant pedagogical orientation included, according to Gloria Ladson Billings from that paper and the other podcast I did, it includes raising critical consciousness and stimulating activism. It stands to reason that teachers' cultural orientation, racial identity, and sense of personal and collective efficacy could help inform adoption and adapt adoption and adaption processes as well. These considerations and approaches to culturally responsive education, professional development, subsequent implementation, and outcomes warrant systematic examination. Student-centered, student-led approaches. Mark, so this is Paulo Freire. Let me break it down for you before I read it. Oh, this is getting tedious, I believe you. Believe me, I know. Uh... Paulo Freire said that there shouldn't be teachers and students in a, in a that there's a dialectic between them, that they're in opposition and they, that the opposition is illegitimate. There shouldn't be a power dynamic of teachers over students or teachers as the authority figures in schools. And in fact, that those things should be integrated so that they're on equal playing field or even that the, the, the students lead uh, the educational process because they themselves know better what needs to be learned because of their position as an oppressed minority by the uh, teachers. The teachers are in a position of authority, so they have a power, they have access to a, a, a upper class power, and so the students have actually more insight about what's really going on in their communities, they have more insight about what it's like to be a student, so really you should have student-led student teachers and teacher students who are going to, as the educational process, and in practice what this does is it completely breaks down the classroom, all the teachers and students are supposed to be buddies or whatever, and uh, it's supposed to be, I mean, you could imagine it almost like one of these very motivational movies like Dead Poets Society or whatever, but in practice, it very rarely works. And in fact, it's a catastrophe most of the time. It leads to huge disciplinary problems where that lack of authority means that the teacher can't actually direct the class. The class wastes a ton of time, spends most of his time doing, trying, attempting classroom management that doesn't work. The curriculum gets diffuse. You cover very little material. Um, As somebody who used to teach, I can tell you it's extremely hard to get through all the material in a course. And if you're making more and more and more time, not just for tangent, uh, lessons about cultural points and all of this garbage, but also that you're um, 
giving the students lots of time to talk and lead things that might be tangential or irrelevant to that curriculum, then uh, you're not going to get through it all. So why are you going to, what are you going to end up with kids who don't get through all their reading lessons, all their vocabulary lessons, all their spelling lessons, all their math lessons, all their science lessons, but who feel like they have a sense of uh, leadership that they actually don't really deserve because they are students and not teachers and that that actual hierarchical authority, unlike what the Marxists believe, is not bad. It's actually necessary. So here, and I've lost track of these two different project-based learning and YPAR, or youth, brown shirts, uh, youth participatory action research. So I'll try to remember what those are, but these, these are basically two student-based, student-led and uh, collaborative learning projects. And I'm just going to have to read the letters because there's keep, can't keep this crap straight. Student-centered, student-led approaches. Student-led in the classroom. Just think about it for a second. Instructional approaches such as uh, project-based learning and youth participatory action research appear to, ha- which I'm sure nobody's heard of hardly at all. They just pulled a couple things out of the hat. Have potential for fostering social, emotional, and academic processes and outcomes for diverse students and adults. Our read of the literature, because these guys are doing so good so far, including the recent scholarship on the science of learning and development, suggests that such approaches are aimed at developing critically informed and engaged students and are thus consistent with transformative SEL. In other words, suggests that such approaches make little communists out of your kids rather than they're going to make them into change agents. Don't worry. They don't have to read or do math. They're going to be change agents. It's consistent with SEL. It makes developing critically critically informed and engaged students who are really good at being activists and really bad at everything else. One of our key interests in these approaches is the ways in which students are engaged in collaborative problem solving around student generated concerns. Collaborative problem solving represents a skill set that is in significant demand in the increasingly complex global community. I think that this has actually been debunked too. Like this collaborative learning places, like there was a big frisson around that, but I don't think it works. I could be wrong. I'm not an education expert, but I think that the efficacy is limited, if not bad. Kids, a lot of, I hate, everybody hated being in a group project except the kid that sucked and got a grade he didn't deserve. Anyway, it impresses us as leveraging academic, social, and emotional learning because collaborative problem solving is defined as a capacity of an individual to effectively engage in a process whereby two or more agents attempt to solve a problem by sharing the understanding and effort required to come to a solution and pooling their knowledge, skills, and efforts to reach that solution which, by the way, requires a hierarchical structure. Just going to point that out uh, to be effective. Indeed, studies have shown that black students both prefer and demonstrate greater social and academic motivation in increased learning in cooperative and communal learning settings. We imagine that identity and belonging are implicated as well. I don't know what to say about that. I don't know the study. Sir et al., 2018 studied a sense of personalized learning and the structural and dynamic qualities of collaborative learning tasks. What you're seeing is collectivism is the goal here, though, of course. Among diverse students and teachers in four high schools, structural quality elements included student-centered culturally responsive activities, group interdependence, balanced group composition and group norms, and task clarity, community Community organization, right? So they're going to become community organizers. Dynamic quality elements included responsive, respectful, and inclusive interactions. Inclusive means censorship. Means no protected class is going to be offended whatsoever, even by the presence of somebody they don't want there, like, say, a white person or a man. Constructive exchanges and shared leadership and decision-making. Although collaborative experience was infrequent, such experiences were associated with students' reports of higher self-efficacy, motivation, and engagement. Black students had higher ratings of collaborative experience than did white students, and high-quality collaboration was associated with higher grades for black students regardless of prior academic performance. Equity and grading. Teacher expectations had less influence on the positive link between collaboration and outcomes for black students than for their white classmates. How did the white classmates do? You didn't say anything about that. PBL encourages collaborative. You didn't also talk about whether it alienated them or they dropped out. Like, I'm not saying that the white students are good students, the black students are bad students. What I'm saying, though, is when you put people in group efforts, sometimes people who, uh, you know, are the high, academic high achievers 
feel like they have to do all the work and it's alienating and it sucks. And if people who are, are doing less of it, some people just like to work in a group. I get that. Like, that's fine. So I'm not saying necessarily any other, anything else, but the point is that, you know, you've got to talk about all the effects of this group activity. Um, because it's alienating to have to do somebody else's work and I, okay. So you said so this was great for black students on average for, didn't say what the reasons are. That's fine. Good. Uh, you didn't say how it affected the white students at all though. And you didn't say anything about, you know, in fact, the relevant variable, which is academic achievement or academic skills. You just assume that black people culturally like to work in groups and that white people culturally like to work individually. And that so working in groups helped the black people and made them feel better because of their cultural values of, of collectiveness and cooperation that you've projected onto them as opposed to the white supremacy culture of um, individuality. Um, just pointing out that that's the critical race theory view of that. Okay, now, project-based learning encourages collaborative problem-solving, but is represented in the CASEL program guide uh, based on improved academic outcomes in a high, sc in a high school economics class. In a high school, a high school economics class. In a high school economics class. And there's one study cited, one class mentioned. There's your evidence, and it's just like your uh, libido pills. Although the notion of PBL, or project-based learning, is quite familiar to educators, it can be introduced into classrooms via school-wide programs, via externally developed classroom curricula, or through teacher-initiated efforts. The Buck Institute for Education in 2015 offered a gold standard for project-based learning that includes A, student learning goals, B, essential design elements, C, project-based teaching practices. I don't really care much about this project based thing, except that it's collaborative and it's probably something that's fun to do sometimes, but a lot of people hate group projects for very good reasons. Student learning goals include key knowledge and understanding, which highlights a student's learning how to apply knowledge to the real world and to use it to solve problems, answer complex questions, and create high quality products. We had an experiment with this kind of shit when I was a senior in high school. I took this class and add a bunch of like civic, civic engagement component. Maybe it's an experiment with this stuff. I don't know. But we were supposed to go help, like, do something at this local elementary school. I don't remember if we were building a garden. I don't remember what we were doing. Um, uh, it was like 17, so it's a long time ago. But all it really amounted to was a handful of people who liked to do some of the work, doing the work, while the rest of us went and, like, ran around in the field at the new elementary school and, like, screwed off. Like, that's really, it was like 20 of us screwing off and, like, four people doing work. And like, then we had to bring in like some kind of materials from home and like everybody had to bring something and like, it really wasn't a productive thing. And I would, I don't know how those handful of students, if they were proud of themselves for what they did. I know that I just thought it was a gigantic waste of time. And I think I was one of the kids that screwed off. I thought it was a whole, the whole thing was just a giant waste of time. Um, and so this project-based learning thing, maybe you can incorporate it, but I'm skeptical. I'm really skeptical. And you could say, oh, I'm a privileged white boy. And that's why I screwed off. Everybody screwed off. We all screwed off except for like a handful of the like teachers, pet kids did not screw off. Everybody else screwed off. Um, so I'm a little skeptical that it's going to produce high quality products because all we did was screw off and it wasn't very good. The key, and we were seniors, by the way, we weren't like ninth graders. The key success skills for students in school, the workplace, and citizens include social and emotional competencies, such as the ability to think critically, uh oh, manage themselves effectively, and work well with others. Those success skills are also referred to as 21st century skills or college and career readiness skills, uh, because individual achievement is out in the 21st century because we're going collectivist, apparently. These skills should be taught in all projects and only through acquisition of content knowledge. Okay, so we have one economics class, and so now this should be in all projects. Gotcha. Essential project design elements for project-based learning include A, a challenging problem or question that is important to students. Which students? All of them? Good luck. B, sustained inquiry that is active in depth and iter iterative. C, we're going to be screwing off in the field. C, authenticity that implies real-world relevance for students. Yeah, that's what you're going to run into. You're going to get all the kids like that. I think that's who did the work in our little project was the kids who actually gave a crap about like gardening or whatever. Nobody else cared. And we, like I said, we ran around and like played tag and like chased each other in this field. We didn't do anything. D, student ownership reflected in their voice and choice. 
E, student and teacher reflection on what, how, and why they are learning through the project. That's where we wrote the stupid essays and gave her little presentations where we went up and lied about how cool and important it was to us that we engaged in this project and what we achieved, even though we ran around and screwed off in the fields and like didn't really, like you think a group of like 30 high school seniors would be able to show up to this thing and be able to like actually, you know, say if it's making gardens, like actually make some garden. There's 30 of us. We ended up, I think it was like a freaking four by 10 plot. It was all that we were able to do. And it wasn't very good. Plus it was also because when the school year lands, it was like in like the winter. And so you can't like, what's a garden in the winter? It's like, it was the stupidest thing we ever did. Um, And you could say, well, it wasn't relevant to the thing. I don't remember how we chose it, but like, what are you going to do? Okay. And so where are we were, reflection, that's where we write our stupid papers and give our stupid presentation and get an A for having run around in the field and then lied about our project. Okay. Critique and revision such that the students should be taught how to give and receive constructive feedback to improve project processes and products and G, a public product that demonstrates learning that supports a solution to a problem or answer to a driving question. Now, let me give you another story. When I was was I a junior in college? So now we're a few years down the road. My roommate was a senior. He was an engineering student. He was actually a fifth year student at that time because he took a year and actually went and worked as an engineering intern for a year and came back through a co-op program. So this is a like 22 year old guy and he's in a group project in a senior engineering project class where the point is to do exactly what this is talking about. And, um, Like it's a kind of a tragic story, but at any rate, he's in this group and there's like four of them or three of them or something. And the one person in his group sucked and all he did ever was complain about how terrible this person was. This is a a senior engineering project class with people who are 22 years old. So at the end of college, all of them had taken a year off of relevant work experience and had already worked in actual workplace projects and they get in a project-based learning environment for the senior level project class where they're supposed to prove that they can collaborate in an engineering project together. And there was two or three of them that did all the work and this one screw up. And then it's very tragic. It turns out the screw up in the, he's complaining about her all day long or the night, the day before their final thing. Cause she'd sucked, never really did anything. And then it turns out she's always been kind of like a half ass student or whatever. And they definitely feel like they're pulling her through and she doesn't deserve to graduate. And then it comes to the final, final presentation. And then she doesn't show up. And I remember he came home so freaking mad. And what actually happened was she died in a car accident on the way there, um, which is like really intense and it like screwed him up real good. Uh, So that actually happened. But the point was, is the death thing isn't the point. The point is that the project based learning, even in, in, engineering students in college in their senior year, all of whom had at least a year of relevant working experience, still didn't work. So I'm skeptical that this PBL crap is a great idea to force into all projects based on the evidence from one economics class that they provide. And this is again, that same thing. They provide scanty evidence for something that they know they can leverage for their Marxist uh, programming and then try to force it into everything because they can make use of it. And the evidence is thin if it exists at all. STEM learning, they tell us, because engineering, what I just said, has been a significant focus of project-based learning, including efforts to align project-based learning curricula with the next generation science standards. Senior engineers with actual project experience couldn't get it together in their engineering class at a, in, in, in my college. In testing this approach, they found that, that compared to non-participating sixth graders, those receiving the next generation science standards aligned curriculum were observed as being more effective in group work. Well, is being more effective in group work actually a goal that we're looking for? Are we looking for actual STEM competency? That's a way they can get away from what actually matters and talk about some shit that doesn't matter so that they can justify implementing their program. It is noteworthy the study included an introductory puzzle so that students could practice group skills and teachers could learn how to, how to allow students to take initiative, deliberate, uh, make mistakes, and solve problems. I'm sure that this is just a wonderful experience having been a teacher. Participating students had higher scores on standardized ELA and math assessments and on science post uh, pre-post assessment. However, Duke et al. showed that the positive impacts of project-based learning for elementary school literacy and social studies. Why is there a however there? 
I guess because it also applies to something else. Uh, in the review of the project-based learning literature, Condliffe et al. 2017 found that project-based learning has been found to increased attendance, again, another grammatical mistake in our education paper, and positive attitudes, no, sorry, increased attendance, I got you, has, has been found to, no, it's a mistake, found to increase attendance, not create increased attendance. So it has found that project-based learning has found to increased attendance and positive attitudes toward diverse classmates. Again, which goals actually matter? Also to positive attitudes toward learning. A reduction in gender gap in science achievement. Boys approved, improved more, probably because they made the girls do the work. And in race uh, and socioeconomic status gaps in math. And I bet you the girls were super happy about the fact that they were doing the boys' homework while the boys were probably like hitting each other with rubber bands or something. That's just guessing because we built a little balsa wood bridges too. Baines, DeBarger, DeVivo, and Warner in 2017 suggested that project-based learning can uh, create an identity-safe learning environment. It sure can, but will it? With reflection, collaboration, expression, and self-direction ownership agency as key elements of social-emotional learning in the project-based learning context. However, these assertions have... This, fe this feels like where we we're doing the dog park paper and we just inserted black criminality, black feminist criminal criminology, I should say, to analyze dog rape so that we could figure it out. Like this project-based learning thing is just horseshit. Like I don't see that this has any relevance to the social emotional learning nonsense, except that it bolsters your paper and kind of makes it look like, this is the feeling I have. It just makes it look like they have more to go on than they really do when they have nothing except their Marxist nonsense. However, these assertions have not been examined systematically. What a freaking shock. Van Horn and Bell, 2017, suggested that project-based learning can link learning and identity in designed learning environments. They advocated for, quote, culturally expansive instructional experiences, a collective endeavor that foster meaningful and transformative forms of learner agency, sense-making, and learning about options for learners' future selves that draw on and connect the lives and cultures of youth outside of the school. Something something feels like activism. Again, this is all just bolstering nonsense. They developed case studies of diverse high school students participating in project-based instructional designs in the context of an eight-week genetic unit and six-week infectious disease unit. Diverse. Consistent with project-based learning precepts, both projects required students to design and conduct research study a research study using contemporary professional scientific tools of the specific disciplinary biology domain. Findings suggest that the students can rely on prior experiences and on notions of future identities to motivate them to engage in disciplinary practices and thereby more fully adopt a disciplinary identity. That's a strange paragraph. Over the past few years, there has been a substantial increase in projects employing YPAR. YPAR is youth, what is it? Youth Prepare Project, fuck, I forgot, uh, active, I, f I even said it earlier, I forgot what it's called. It's brown shirts. Oh, active action research. It's, uh, it is, YPAR is, uh, is a, well, it just says here, is a youth centered form of community based participatory research. That's what it is. Youth participatory action research. There we go. So the youth are participating in act activism. Uh, which is used frequently in public health, social work, and community psychology to actively engage underserved children, youth, and adults in identifying and addressing local real-world problems through an iterative research and action process. Like, you're not teaching them statistics, but send them out as social, social workers, and it should be great. In this sense, it has been argued that youth participatory action research is useful in efforts to address racial, ethnic, and class-based equity concerns. It's been suggested, no argued. That's argued okay. Important to note, Kornbuth, Ozer, Allen, and Kirshner in 2015 described the ways in which such projects advance the uh, socio-political development of children and youth, in other words, turning them into activists, while addressing academic standards such as common core state standards and next generation state standards, in other words, communist education. Like community-based participatory research, contextual, uh, contextual factors help shape youth participatory action research projects. However, Ozer 2016 suggested that there are core non-negotiables to this approach. These include A, engaging youth in the training and practice of research skills, 
B. Strategic thinking. And C. Strategies for influencing change on a youth-identified topic. So it's about creating activists, and you have to teach them how to do research so they can go do their activism. You have a topic of their choosing. The use of social science research skills positions youth as experts, critical consumers, and producers of knowledge. That's what expert means, by the way, a critical consumer and producer of knowledge about what? About their lived experiences and of the required processes for bringing about desired changes. Activists. Identity Marxist activists. Second, the research process is understood to be an iterative problem, identification analysis, design, action, reflection, cycle. That's a lot of words for one idea. Sounds like uh, design action reflection sounds like theory practice reflection, which sounds like a dialectic. Finally, there must be a careful attention to adult sharing of power with students throughout the process. This represents distributive justice such that adults, teachers, youth workers are appropriately understood to be the co-learners and facilitators rather than experts or primary decision makers in the youth participatory action research project or process. Ozer et al. 2010 proposed classroom-level processes that include teacher-student power sharing, academic relevant research and advocacy skills, group or collaborative work, positive class climate, and networking opportunities. With regard to competence development, Ozer et al. proposed that uh, YPAR participants should should result in youth-level outcomes such as positive ethnic identity and sense of purpose, which is self-awareness in CASEL, enhanced individual and collective efficacy, which is self-management and relationship skills, and increased school bonding and social networks and support, which is social awareness and relationship skills. This makes intuitive sense to us. Shit, let's just program this all the way through the schools then. However, we are unaware of the direct assessments of these assertions. Well, we better have a transformative approach anyway. Research studies have been conducted in elementary, middle, and high school and out of high school time settings. We focus on school-based YPAR for the present article. The bulk of the school-based studies reflect the establishment of small student groups who volunteer and are and or are recommended to participate in student voice initiatives. Practically all of the studies are smaller scale qualitative examination of the youth participatory action research process. Young people seek to address a range of topics relevant to their sense of personal and community well-being, of course, including food access, community violence, and reforms in the juvenile justice system. It would be helpful, I guess it would be so helpful for them if you just worked in all this stupid Marxism for them to do that. However, many projects focus on the educational systems. With regard to school reform, student action research has, for example, offered input on school curriculum and governance, sought to change school lunches, and advocated for the implementation of anti-bullying, behavioral monitoring, and service learning opportunities. Probably a mixed bag of good and bad, but again, the how matters. Voight, 2015, described the development of a student voice project in a predominantly black, low-resourced middle school. Three representative students' voice teams, sorry, three representative student voice teams were established through the joint recommendation of the school climate coordinator and grade level teacher teams. Teams met for one hour a week, during which adults used Socratic questioning to help surface root causes of identified problems and possible solutions. Each group generated a project. For example, the seventh grade group recommended and was supported in developing an anti-bullying video to show in, in classes, as well as a poster and other products to display in the school's public spaces. Now, I'm not going to make a case for bullying, but just as a tangential comment right here, I'm not going to make a case for bullying in general, but Marxists really want there not to be any bullying because they're going to get beat up when they try this, like their weirdo nerd shit and their insufferable egos never get put into check. So I'm not making a case for bullying. I'm just saying anti-bullying, great project. Not that bullying's good. But Marxists benefit the most from anti-bullying. Turns out to be a point. Across the projects, educators and students reported greater trust in each other. There was also an increase in team-based peer relations and some evidence, some evidence, of increased academic motivation, positive social norms, and pro-social behavior. No uh, educational outcomes necessarily, though. Can they read? 
there are precious few experimental studies of youth participatory action research efforts. So let's just pad our freaking paper about transformative SEL with it. There's very few experimental studies. Let's just pad our paper with it to justify a communist program in education. Ah. In one such study, Ozer and Douglas, 2013, reported on the use of a within-school randomized experimental design to compare the effects of elective direct service and youth research, YPAR, classes on psychological empowerment of a relatively small sample of diverse high school students. Students in the YPAR condition reported higher levels of social political skills, such as persuasiveness and efficacy, motivation to influence their schools and communities, in other words, they became activist-oriented, decision-making and problem-solving skills, as assessed by WHO, and participatory behavior, including speaking with other students about school improvement, in other words, becoming activist advocates. It's noteworthy that Ozer and Douglas in 2013 developed the YPAR process template to advance continuous improvement of the YPAR efforts by linking key processes with proposed student outcomes. Focal processes include training and practice of research skills, practicing strategic thinking and discussing change strategies, activism, integrative interaction of research and action, Marxist activism, building school and community-based networks, community activism, and teacher-student power sharing in the action research process. So breaking down the hierarchy and teaching kids that breaking down the hierarchy is key. Four teachers facilitated 14 semester-long cohorts of diverse high school students. It's always diverse ones. Teachers adapted a version of an existing curriculum and received monthly consultation with university partners. This type of continuous improvement process seems essential to developing high quality youth, youth participatory action research opportunities. Seems that way. One of the major findings was that power sharing over major decisions and power sharing over daily structure were both associated positively with students' behavioral engagement. Kirchner, 2015, reported on the efforts of a group of, on a group of 5th to 12th grade classroom teachers from seven schools who sought to integrate a critical civics perspective, that sounds great, Marxist civics, into their academic content, content courses. So all of your other academic content has to have Marxist civics worked into it. Teachers were all capital W white, taught varying grades, and had a range of teaching philosophies. The overarching intent was to foster the socio-political development of students of color to create race activists and those from low-income backgrounds through opportunities for critique and collective agency to achieve school reform, activism, teaching activism, and through critical race theory. Toward this end, teachers used, quote, three signature practices of shared power, critical conversations about education and identity, and participatory action research critical activism. Although all were able to complete action research projects that culminated in presentations to relevant policymakers, Kirstner shed light on the ways in which the teachers struggled with this launching and sustaining this type of transformative effort. Well, it's hard as hell to do, but just force them to do it and waste all everybody's time. These included, for example, structural challenges associated with an overemphasis on testing and administrators' discomfort with students' critique of schooling. Really? Destabilizing the school out from under the administrators might make them upset. There were also instructional challenges that included teacher experiences of vulnerability and loss of power. Did they get beat up by their students by any chance? That's happening. Student apathy, what a shock. And discomfort with discussions of race, no kidding. It sounds like your program's working beautifully. Your critical citizenship project or whatever the hell you're doing here, what was it, a critical civics perspective into all of your stuff? How did it work out? There were also instructional challenges that included teacher experiences of vulnerability and loss of power, student apathy, and discomfort with discussions of race. He encouraged teachers interested in pursuing this type of work to develop allies among colleagues and, colleagues and community stakeholders and to experiment with the practices to adapt and improve applications to the local context. That's very Freyrian. Implied here is a critical need for teacher identity work and for the development of personal and collective efficacy to advance transformative SEL. No, the, so what you're saying is you said all that crap because what's implied here is a critical need for teacher identity work so that it, so this is bullshit that doesn't work can go 
and the development of personal and collective efficacy. Why? Because the real goal isn't to educate your kids or to educate kids at all. It is to advance transformative SEL, which is a Maoist program in your schools. So instead, let me read that part again. He encouraged teachers interested in pursuing this type of work to develop allies among colleagues and community stakeholders and to experiment with the practices to adapt and improve applications to the local context. No, how about you just teach them how to do some fucking math? It's not that hard. Like, stop with the social experimenting. Stop training the kids to be activists. Just teach them stuff. Oh, no, because what's actually needed here is a bunch of work on the teachers themselves who failed this. It wasn't the program that's stupid. The teachers didn't do it well enough because they have a, they, they need to do critical identity work and develop personal and collective efficacy because they need to advance transformative SEL because that's the only thing that matters. doesn't matter that it doesn't work. doesn't matter that it's all a flop. doesn't matter any of it. doesn't matter that it push, it has all these bad effects. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work. No, it's great. Why is this even in the paper? This makes no sense. It doesn't even support their thing, except they can then make this point that the people who tried it were the ones who actually had the problem and the program itself is great. And it's facilitated because it might, or it can be, it should be facilitated because it might lend itself to the transformative SEL that they must advance at all costs. Next steps. So we're obviously at the end or getting to the end of the paper. Finally, this article represents an effort to establish and flesh out transformative SEL as an approach that we believe to have merit. If researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders are interested in advancing equity and excellence in education, what if you didn't like this transformative SEL? Well, you must be somebody who, if you're a researcher, practitioner, or stakeholder, you must not have an interest in advancing equity and excellence because you assume from the outset that transformative SEL, by definition, advances equity and excellence in education. So this says this this is an approach that we believe to have merit if researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders are interested in advancing equity and excellence in education. The effort was, and even though we just read literally the previous paragraph, is like this totally was a catastrophe that didn't work. This effort was informed by Castle's strategic foci, or foci, I guess, F-O-C-I, foci, and our uh, plural of focus. There are five pillars. And our assertion of a transformative form of SEL. Their assertion of one. Uh, And our assertion of a transformative form of SEL generates a number of possible next steps. One immediate set of considerations has to do with CASEL tools and resources. As we further sharpen the conceptualization of multiple forms of SEL, we will need to turn attention to how these advances are represented in, for example, the CASEL framework. We will also, that's the brand name, that's the thing that has all the money, so they have to put it there. We will also wrestle with the ways in which this expanded SEL framework or framing might be uh, might best be reflected in the Castle program review, which they're trying to colonize, which is already bad, and they're colonizing it, and other popular resources and tools. In many respects, this article represents an opportunity to add additional substance and nuance to these deliberations. Yeah, sounds like it. With district partners, we are pushing, or sorry, we are pursuing action research on the development of proposed transformative social and emotional competencies with a particular emphasis on issues of identity, agency, belonging, and collaborative problem solving. You're not doing a good job of it, though. In, in doing so, we are using a research practice partnership approach to gain a nuanced understanding. I don't know what that means. Uh, a nuanced understanding of influences and impacts on young people and adults within and across local learning contexts, for example, school, family, and community. This will help us determine scaling strategies within and across districts and states. That way they can sell it as a huge consultant program, then they're going to rip off all the taxpayers while they ruin your kids. As we try to suggest herein, identity should be understood to be multidimensional, multifaceted, and intersectional, so it's Marxist. The apparent dearth of systemic information on white racial identity and development is unfortunate and needs to be addressed. Bring in Robin D'Angelo. And although we highlighted ethnic and racial identity in this article, class and gender identity are also critical aspects of how students and adults conceive themselves. As with other social and emotional competencies, the development course of the complex uh, of the complex of interpersonal intrapersonal and institutional competencies separately and with regard to their intersections warrants attention. When we were writing the Grievance Studies Affair, we wrote sentences like that with lots of things that we should do to make it look like we were thinking in a forward way with lots of possibilities, but it's just BS. 
It is just trying to make yourself look like you have more going on here than you really do. Given our assertion that social emotional competencies are inclusive of civic knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors, that is, in the development of citizenship, which remember that was meaning for Marxism, person centered and qualitative analytic approaches might be a productive way forward. Person centered and qualitative. Get rid of the data. Don't look at it in terms of what it actually accomplishes in a data quantitative driven way because they want it to be qualitative and soft, person centered, that sounds fake, so that they can very easily shove this shit down kids' throats without any accountability in terms of having any evidence that it's actually going to work. We're particularly curious about the composition and dynamics of peer networks and adult facilitation of collaborative problem-solving efforts. Because we embrace Castle's ecological framework for systemic social-emotional learning, we are also interested in developing schools, families, communities, and the workplaces as developmental context for transformative competence development. In other words, they want to take this not just into the schools, but they want to get it out into the families, communities, and workplaces around the schools so they can do their Marxist indoctrination through social-emotional uh, cult programming uh, all throughout the community. The literature points to a number of, pro of approaches, programs, and practices that are consistent with transformative SEL as they help advance aspects of the transformative social and emotional competencies for children, youth, and adults. Of course, adult social emotional learning is critical to any transformative SEL effort. The prospect of widespread racial bias means that pre- and in-service professional development efforts associated with this form of social-emotional learning must include critical content and experiences aimed at humanizing understand, uh, underserved students and affirming their rights and, and assets in co-constructing an equitable and excellent educational experience. So now we've got to make sure that we indoctrinate all the teachers and teacher training to think in terms of transformative SEL, and we have to use critical race theory gender theory, queer theory, et cetera, to do it so that we can co-construct. Remember, because we're social man, like Marx had, we're all in this together. We're all social man. So we're going to co-construct um, an equitable and excellent educational experience. So excellence keeps falling out because equity and excellence turn out not to be compatible. In fact, equity and excellence are by definition opposites. If everything's equal in outcome, there's no excellence. Because excellence means ex like exceeding expectations. So it's, it's inherently contradictory, but isn't that great when you're in a dialectical Marxist frame? The extant research base on critical, uh, culturally responsive education and identity develop development comprises smaller scale studies uh -huh, that are li largely qualitative in nature. Uh huh. In other words, there's no fucking evidence for it. There appear to be a few there appear to be few studies that assess issues of culture and identity and link them with other more common indicators of social, emotional, and academic competence. What a shock! There's no evidence for it. The prevailing focus in the SEL field on a, on larger scale quantitative experimental studies has limited the attention given to this work by social emotional learning researchers. At the same time, culturally responsive education is commonly understood to be highly contextualized and difficult for educators to enact because it's meant to, you're set up to fail. I've talked to like a dozen educators, a dozen teachers who are like, I'm out. It's always like, go do this. It's actually impossible. The instructions are not clear. And when you try to do it, it always fails. And it's always your fault. And you never did it right. And I'm done. I'm out. I'm out of this. I've talked to so many educators who've said this, that they feel like that these programs, culturally responsive education in particular, or relevant, whichever one, are designed to make it so they can't do it right. And then they're held accountable for not doing it right. So it's constantly grinding them down in that tr classic Marxist way. Oh, well, here we are. Highly contextualized and difficult for educators to enact. As such, more needs to be known about the simil about similarities and differences in content and pedagogy across contexts. No, just stop doing it. Specifically, we would seek insights into the ways in which power sharing opportunities, which teachers tell me are a complete disaster everywhere they are, might occur as it occur uh, as it cultivates distributive justice. Yet again, complete disaster. A central motivating principle of the transformative SEL. Remember at the beginning when we talked, maybe not because like three days ago, uh, the distributive justice boiled down to communism. It meant redistributing shares. Yeah, well, there you go. It doesn't work. The nature and delivery of academic social and emotional content is also of interest as it undergirds effective collaborative problem solving. Again, your teacher 
yeah, you're going to have to interact with kids having a hard time or struggling or whatever, but it's not your teacher's job to deliver social and emotional content, right? Student-centered and student-led research, or sorry, approaches like project-based learning and youth uh, YPAR action research are consistent with the core principles of culturally responsive education. Irrelevant, maybe? Responsive. However, they are more intentional more inten- they just said though they don't work however they're more intentional about positioning students as experts on their own lived experience oh well, there you go uh, that's to bring up that the there's the idea again that you're structurally determined your positionality your cultural re- reference are more important and they count as actual knowledge and exp- this is the most indulgent marxist identity marxist woke marxist whatever you want to call it teaching program you could possibly imagine it's it's absolutely and are they learning math no they're they're experts on their own lived experience and they're capable of working with their peers and adults to leverage academic content and skills to devise and iteratively test ways to advance collective well-being what the hell is collective well-being no like culturally responsive education work in this area tends to small (laughs) tends to small scale and to not include assessment of relevant social and emotional competencies you have no evidence for what you are trying to force in schools all the way across the entirety of america all across north america this transformative sel has no the pieces that they're describing have no evidence for for them none and this is well they wrote a paper it's great It is unclear the degree to which project-based learning is offered in schools serving students of color and or students in under-resource settings, under-resource settings. Again, another grammatical error in our education paper, spelling error. So more insights are needed uh, into how high-quality opportunities can be afforded these young people. However, it seems evident that students and adults, yeah, let's make sure that the low-income kids and the, the minorities have shit that doesn't work crammed onto them. Uh, because why? Because then you can work in this social emotional crap in conjunction with it and you can turn them into little race communists. However, it seems evident that students and adults from such communities do participate in and benefit from youth participatory action research. I can't believe I can actually remember it sometimes. Consistent with findings from social psychology studies just cited, Ruben, El Haj, Graham, and Clay, 2016, re- reported on a semester long study of the ways in which student. Uh, student teaching in a YPAR classroom influenced the learning per- of pre-service teachers. Student teaching in a teacher education graduate program. Participating teachers learned how to engage in student-centered teaching practices, gained an appreciation for student assets, and developed insights into the structural inequities their students experience. What does that have to do with kids being able to learn anything or do anything? You just indoctrinated grad students in education. So What? Transformative SEL requires explicit, critical examination of the root causes of racial and economic inequities to foster the desired critical self and social awareness and responsible individual and collective actions in young people and adults. That's their next sentence. What did that mean? Let's translate it. Transformative social-emotional learning requires explicit communism into the root causes of race, so critical race theory and economic Marxist inequality or inequities to foster the de- the desired critical and self critical self and social awareness critical consciousness and responsible individual and collective actions in other words collective activism in young people and adults transformative sel requires using marxist theory to create marxist activists that's what it means there's no doubt as to what this is about no doubt as to what this is it don't let anybody gaslight you There is no doubt as to what transformative SEL is. It is, requires, it says, explicit Marxist application of Marxist theory to race and economic inequities to foster the desired critical consciousness uh, to inspire collective activism in young people and adults. Programs and approaches that focus on identity development and or systematic efforts to integrate issues of race, class, and culture into the academic content can have greater utility to the degree that they advance aspects of identity that comport with transformative SEL. What does that mean? Programs and approaches that focus on identity development, so not math, or systematic efforts to integrate race, Identity Marxism, race, class, culture, Marxism 
into the academic content of other subjects can do what? They can have greater de- greater utility in terms of whatever they're trying to achieve to the degree that they advance aspects of identity that comport with transformative SEL. What are the aspects of identity that comport with transformative SEL? Critically conscious identities. So in other words, the more that you make your math class, your science class, your English class, your social studies class about identity Marxism, the more it'll work with us with 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 transformative SEL. The more the the more you put this into the other things, the kids with critical consciousness are going to rele- uh, going to going to resonate with it more. So you're creating out of the school system, not a school system that educates, but one that serves a growing commissariat and activist class, a growing red guard and the commissars that are going to come out of it. That's what transformative SEL is about. Although considerable attention is given to historically disenfranchised groups, meaningful and sustainable change requires transformations in ways in which those experiencing relative privilege understand themselves and their role in ameliorating inequities and interpersonal and institutional context. So what that means is you're going to bring white fragility in so you can burn, burn the white kids down to, uh, to make them allies. The limited evidence on this seems mixed, <laughs> doesn't it, at best. Project-based and youth-led action-oriented approaches may have the greatest purchase, they had the least evidence for them, as they provide a context for children, youth, and adults to work together to synthesize and cultivate critical academic, social, and emotional competencies, to include an iterative cycle of action, reflection, and refinement of strategies, that's dialectic approach, they enact to realize collective well-being in the broader national and international contexts. The end. Funding. Support for this manuscript was provided by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and the University of Michigan. Thanks, Zuck. Thanks, Facebook. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative paid for this pile of crap. So now we know what transformative SEL, which is the operative form of SEL, is transformative so the, the sel story is maybe sel is a trojan horse from the beginning and maybe it wasn't at any rate when you apply it in the right context with the right professionals and in, in, in small settings with individual students who are having problems you can increase certain outcomes and that's fine then we're going to d- adopt this participatory we're going to step away from an individual based model into a participatory specific participatory model that's getting a little collectivist we're going to wrap that up under a castle programming that's now a brand name that has all of these weird ties to it i'm not 100 percent sure but i think that panorama thing with the justice department is tied to this we should check that um but you have a big brand name all of a sudden. It's getting more collectivist. You're moving away from individual success to group success through civic participation that maybe uh, is, that it isn't maybe that is getting hijacked by um, critical civic participation. In other words, Marxist participation. And then you're gonna. That's not even good enough. You're now gonna hijack Castle with transformative SEL, and transformative SEL is unambiguously just ramming as much Marxist collectivism into that as possible for the purposes of breaking your kids down psychologically so that you can use these pieces of critical theory uh, in collectivism to give them a a way to become... uh, out of that vulnerability, in other words, to induce them into the Marxist cult. You're going to create vulnerability and you're going to give them a path out by adopting Marxist identity. That's what transformative SEL is about. It is about systematically in inappropriate context with your kid's teacher as a psychologist, which they are not, doing group psychology, which they should not, in an uncontrolled environment called a classroom, which should never happen, in order to break them down so that they can do a cult programming of them into Marxist ideologies that they picked up in grad school. That's transformative SEL. So you have SEL as an individual component. It's very, uh, you know, successful. Castle steps in, makes a brand name on it, probably sells some mostly snake oil in the wrong context. And then the Marxists completely hijack that with transformative SEL, which is the dominant form of SEL. Like I said, that's going to transform going forward into what was hinted here into liberatory education, which is straight up Marxist education, straight up nightmare. And now you know what SEL is. And now you also know exactly why what I've said throughout the various parts of this podcast, the people who are intentionally implementing SEL belong in prison. 
This is child abuse for the purpose of failing them in education so that they can become activists to tear apart their society. And it's absolutely, absolutely unexcusable, inexcusable, inexcusable, since we're making grammatical errors in our papers. Now you know what SEL is in its own words. I know this was crazy long, uh, but we had to cover it. It's the longest podcast I've ever done at over four hours and 15 minutes now. But that's what SEL really is. Now, if you are, you can have taken notes, you can go back through this. If you ever have four hours again, you can go back through this. You can get some sense of what SEL is, and then you can start feeling confident that you can go to people at your state house, people at your school board, people in the school administration and fight like hell to get this out. You can be confident that when the teachers unions, for example, or whatever consultant groups or whatever push this, that you can uh, call for their disbanding, call for them for lawsuits against them or whatever else. This absolutely must be fought. This absolutely must be stopped. And I would tell you in the meantime, you need to get your kids away from transformative SEL. Uh, you need to protect your kids from transformative SEL. There is nothing good about this. Most importantly, is that it's a malice program to destroy your kids. Read, uh, go listen to Groomer Schools 3 if you have another hour and a half or whatever. But second, most importantly, you he heard, heard throughout the program or through the, through the podcast and you heard throughout their conclusion, well, we basically don't have any evidence for this. And yet they're implementing it completely like universally throughout the entire country. That's completely unjustifiable, and the people involved should go to prison. That's my last word about SEL.